And I want to, I'm very delighted to welcome you back for the second day and a special welcome to all of you who are joining uh, online throughout the world. We're very pleased to have you with us. Yesterday, we heard uh, some inspiring messages as well as some cautionary messages as we reflect on 50 years since the Stockholm Declaration of 1972. Um, Professor Jeff Sachs yesterday noted that in many respects, we have failed to change the trajectory, the self-destructive trajectory of our planet throughout the past 50 years, and that law has played frequently a negative role in working toward environmental conservation and sustainable development. Um, but law also presents many great opportunities and is necessary in order to ensure um, an equitable transition toward a more sustainable future. Uh, we were pleased last evening to hear from Inger Anderson, Inger Anderson, the UNEP Executive Director, um, <clears throat> who spoke of how we might be able to turn toward uh, a new and more inclusive multilateral approach to environmental protection. So I'm looking forward to our continued discussions today with so many distinguished speakers, uh, high court judges from throughout the world, and many other experts who will be speaking to us about access to justice issues and other topics um, related to environmental law. So I'm pleased to, to turn to our first panel of the day, uh, which will be on an, an official launch of the Global Judicial Environmental Portal, uh, an important initiative of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, um, together with the UN Environment Program and other partners, um, to provide an opportunity for judges to exchange information and share and exchange experiences about environmental adjudication uh, in order to promote um, <clears throat> and uh, disseminate information about access to justice and other environmental matters. So I'd like to call up here to the front Justice Antonio Benjamin from the National High Court of Brazil and the president of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. And would also like to welcome uh, other members of this panel who are joining us virtually on Zoom. Eva Duer, legal officer from uh, the UN Environment Program. Judge Marc Clément from the Administrative Court of Lyon in France and Peter Spielman, Associate Legal Officer at the UN Environment Program. Please, Justice Benjamin. And, and, and the chair. Oh, and- We have two co-chairs. Uh, yes, and two co-chairs for our uh, panel as well. Uh, Justice Luc Lavrissen, President of the Constitutional Court of Belgium and Chair of the European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment, who is joining us uh, online, and Donald Kanyaru, uh, former Director of the UN Environment Program Law Division. Um, as well. So please join us here at the front. Good morning, <clears throat> Stockholm. Uh, greetings. And with that, Dakar. I'll turn it over then to the chairs of our panel, Justice Lavrisan and uh, Donald Kaniaru. So good morning, uh, Stockholm. Oh, yes. Greetings from Dakar, Senegal. Please. I am attending here a like uh, conference the, of uh, the Constitutional uh, Court. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I will just explain the gifts that you have uh, been uh, provided with. Unfortunately, you look, <laughs> haven't got any. It's on the tables here in Stockholm. Uh, unfortunately, the letter here, it's from Hanna Wert, who you met yesterday, uh, the chairman of the Swedish uh, Association for Judges uh, that has provided you with these small gifts. Uh, unfortunately, due to the constraints of our po post office, we haven't got the uh, cheese slicer that is mentioned in the letter from her. But I hope you will accept these small gifts anyhow, and I uh, hope you will continue to have a fruitful conference today. Thank you. So thank you uh, very, very much. 
So, uh, as uh, indicated by Nick uh, Breiner, we will have uh, this morning the official launch of the Global Judicial Environmental uh, uh, Portal. It's one of the, let's say, major projects of the Global Judicial uh, Institute on the Environment. And I think we uh, can uh, say that just judges must be able to communicate with each other, uh, to learn from each other, to have access to sources of environmental law, including jurisprudence. And, and because the environment is a worldwide uh, issue, uh, also jurisprudence from other parts uh, of uh, the uh, world. And of course, uh, these days, uh, if we are looking to uh, sharing uh, information, having access to information. Uh, we have to, to look, we cannot others than to look to the internet and to uh, ICT uh, technologies. Uh, in this panel, we have uh, four speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, live, I understand, in Stockholm, is uh, Justice Antonio Herman. Uh, Benjamin, who is the chair of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. And uh, of course, he took uh, also the initiative uh, for the development of this uh, uh, Global Judicial Environmental uh, Portal. I think I uh, do not need to uh, pre uh, present to you uh, Mr. Judge uh, Justice Antonio Herman uh, Benjamin because I think uh, yesterday was uh, in uh, nearly uh, every, uh, every panel, I, uh, I think. The second uh, and the third speakers uh, are uh, in the first place, uh, Eva Dewar uh, and then uh, Peter Spielman, both uh, uh, from Informea. Uh, Informea is the United Nations uh, inf information portal on uh, multilateral uh, environmental agreements and uh, the uh, uh, judicial portal has been developed uh, in close uh, cooperation and with the support of uh, Informea. Eva Dewar is a legal officer uh, in the team and team leader of what's called the Collective Intelligence for Environmental Governments, uh, Governance of UNEP and Peter Spielman is uh, the associate legal officer with uh, 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 the same uh, unit. Furthermore, and maybe that can come as a surprise, there are also some, uh, let's say, ICT nerds within the judiciary, uh, including one of the judges who is in the panel, uh, being Judge Marc Clément, who is now a presiding a judge with the Administrative Court of Lyon, but that's just one uh, of uh, his uh, activities. He is a further more member uh, of the Autorité Environnementale in France. He's also a member of the Arus uh, uh, Convention uh, uh, Compliance uh, uh, Committee, and uh, he has been closely uh, uh, involved uh, with the development of uh, the uh, portal. And uh, I, I, uh, I uh, said he is a, uh, an, an ICT nerd. He developed also uh, different websites uh, for different uh, associations of judges, uh, including the first, uh, the first website of the European Union Forum for judge, uh, of Judges for the Environment. So I will give now uh, the floor to uh, Justice Antonia Herman uh, uh, Benjamin, who is with you in uh, Stockholm. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for those that are dif in different time zones. Uh, I would like to begin thanking uh, Hannah Vert, uh, the president of the Association of Swedish uh, Judges, for giving us not just a, a lovely gift, but a useful gift. Uh, I'm already using um, mine. Uh, so please, uh, I ask Judge uh, Bergson to convey uh, to her that it was very 
uh, appreciated uh, the the gifts that um, um, we received. Um, let me thank uh, the two co-chairs and I'll be brief because we are more interested in knowing um, how our portal, the judicial portal of the Global Judicial Institute and the Environment in cooperation with FIUNAP uh, looks uh, and what it can offer and how we can add more to this. As uh, Justice Luc Lavrisen mentioned, and he, um, I believe he is in Dakar, and that's why he is not able to be with us uh, here today in person. The Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, even before it was formally started, the founding members, several of them are here, others are connected, wanted to build a, a judicial portal. So that was the first thing that came to all those that were involved in the preliminary discussion that led to the establishment of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment in 2016. And it, it was decided that we would build a judicial portal by judges for judges. As um, I don't need to um, repeat that for us judges is very important that we preserve the independence of our work and not just the way we see ourselves, but the way we are seen by by others. Then I had um, the opportunity to meet Eva Doer, who is with us. And I already knew about the fantastic work that she and her colleagues was, uh, were do doing within the context of the MEAs and building uh, a set of jurisprudence but also um, uh, connecting that jurisprudence with the uh, specific MEAs. And also back many years before, IUCN, FAO and uh, UNEP established what was then called and still called ECOLEX, more on legislation and also um, embryonary um, jurisprudence. So we discussed among ourselves, among the judges, and we thought that why invent the wheel if we could work together with our natural partner, UNAP. So that's how it began. And many thanks to Eva and later on to Peter, um, both of them will be speaking and presenting um, the extraordinary uh, preliminary results, not the final um, um, portal, but this is the global launch. We, we have already launched uh, regionally and um, more incomplete versions of the portal, but now the portal is operational with the exception of the part of the portal that is um, reserved for judges. Only judges will have access uh, to that part, but I will not go into the technicalities because both Eva and uh, Peter will explain that. From the Global Judicial Institute um, on the environment side, we asked two colleagues to take the lead in, in, the, in this uh, collaborative work with UNEP and they generously, kindly accepted the task. First, Justice Luc Lavrissen uh, and second, uh, Judge Marc Clement. And they have both participated in technical discussions, um, virtually, in person, and uh, I am on behalf of the judges uh, of the Institute, very grateful uh, to both of them. 
So I think that's um, in a nutshell, a very brief introduction. I'm not going to use my 15 minutes. Uh, one last point though. We uh, judges depend on knowledge and information. But it's not just any knowledge or any information. It has to be good knowledge, both legal and non-legal, and information, both legal and non-legal. And as Ju Justice Lovrisen has just stated, we also depend on communication among ourselves. And communication or means of communications in which we feel that we are safe to discuss in a reserved manner among us about um, concrete cases that or difficulties that we are facing uh, in our work um, as a judge. And the portal, as you are going to see, provides um, for that. The next step that we are working as we speak is to finalize an MOU uh, with UNAP. We still, um, we couldn't do it before because the Institute was not registered uh, in Geneva. Now it's fully registered and we can then proceed to a more formal uh, approach to this um, uh, rich and important uh, collaboration. Um, Mr. Chair, in fact, the two chairs, uh, Donald Cuniaro and Luc Lavrisen, I stop here because I think everyone is much more interested on the portal itself than in on uh, things that I, I could say as an, a known expert. Thank you. So thank you very much, Justice uh, Antonio Herman Benjamin. Let's turn now directly uh, to Eva and Peter to give us a glimpse of uh, this uh, judicial portal. So please, Eva, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you so much, uh, Luke, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Justin Benjamin and Luke Larison, for this introduction. Uh, indeed, this is a very exciting day uh, for us. Uh, we have been having this collaboration flourishing over the past years, and uh, it is, of course, a, a big moment to have the judicial portal uh, officially launched today. And as both uh, justices have already indicated, uh, and, and Justice Benjamin, you have initiated this whole uh, process. We have been approached by the Global Judicial Institute first in 2018, and, uh, and there were initial brainstorming discussions. And, uh, and of course, we were very excited about this development right away. Um, and um, indeed, the Global Judicial Institute was welcomed as a partner to the Informea Initiative in 2018. And as you said, it was already a, an opportunity for UNEP to having piloted and tested a system that allows different knowledge sources to independently uh, connect to each other and share each other's information. And of course, the MEAs who had increasingly developed interest in jurisprudence and how jurisprudence actually brings to the ground international law uh, have been very enthusiastic about this collaboration. And so a, very, a first prototype was then developed uh, already in August and presented. And from there, there were a lot of, uh, you know, maturi maturity issues and further development issues, a lot of discussions with Justice Clement, Justice Laurison, and, um, and in the end of the day, uh, the first beta version was launched uh, or was presented to the third General Assembly of the Global Judicial Institute in this, on the 8th of December in uh, 2021 at the height of the COVID situation where it was very fitting to make this information accessible for the first time without much outreach. And as it has been mentioned, and I think this is very important from UNEP's side to mention, uh, it is indeed very important that both aspects that, of course, the Global Judicial Institute is independent in managing 
the networking element and other elements of the portal. And at the same time, it's very important for us to still mention that the value of this portal, which is the jurisprudence collection and many and the capacity building section for the non so for the for the non members for the for the public at large is of course where the interests of UNEP and the Global Judicial Institute totally converge, and it's important to mention that what is on the Global Judicial Institute's uh, judicial portal will go straight to Ecolex, will go straight into Informia, will go straight to other tools that are servicing other stakeholders, and this is a very important asset and a very important value from the UNEP's point of view. And of course, vice versa, it also means that some of the assets that are developed under Informea, like online courses or the support of the glossary and tagging support are available to the portal. And that is how it all comes together so that there is not the uh, feeling that there are more and more portals developed. These portals that are servicing specific stakeholder groups are all linked in the background and build on each other's knowledge. Uh, what has happened since this first uh, beta version was made available at the end of last year? Um, without any outreach, there were already over 50,000 people finding the judicial portal online. And the education of a recent review of the Infraria portal's uh, project performance, uh, there was also a small question to the audience uh, whether they are familiar with the judicial portal and those who said they are familiar have already, even though not all services are fully functional and most importantly, the networking section is still being developed, they were already very, uh, they co already considered the portal very useful. And so this gives us uh, a great sense of anticipation as to where uh, we will go. Um, and as I uh, proceed from here, we just wanted to show you um, how this pans out in reality, in terms of uh, what does it mean that the, diff that the tools are uh, linked. And so this is the Global Judicial Portal as it is being launched today. Um, I hope you are seeing the right screen, are you? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, but I'm somehow missing uh, the, the right one on my end. So let me give it one more try. Oh, it's probably... Okay, now I think I'm sharing the right screen. Uh, and if you go to uh, from here to the e-learning section, because I will then let Peter show the main services, uh, you already find the courses that are available through um, the, 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 the resources section, uh, which includes many materials that come from some of the other tools. And here you can jump right into e-learning courses. In this case, there is a course on, on climate litigation that has been made available just a few weeks ago. And uh, all this information is available from uh, the Informia portal that, of course, encompasses many courses that could be interesting and relevant. And I also wanted to show that in the context of the glossary of the judicial portal, it is possible to then get further information on related treaties and related legislation from these linked tools, such as here, the Law and Environment Assistance Platform, which is the platform of the Montevideo Law, uh, Montevideo 5 process, or here, on the treaty text of the Kyoto Protocol, which you can access from the judicial portal and how it relates to the SDGs, which are on the forefront of today's joint struggle uh, for the environment. So uh, with this uh, very brief uh, introduction, I will uh, maybe hand over to Peter to show you the most key features of the judicial portal. And thank you so much for your continued collaboration. Once again, specifically, to uh, Judge Clement and Judge Laurissen, and of course, uh, Judge um, Benjamin for this excellent collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. So now the floor is to Peter. Thanks, Justice Laurissen, and thanks, uh, Eva, for introducing the background and, and Justice Benjamin. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present a bit in more detail the portal today. We're very excited to see the fruition of, of, this, uh, of this number of years of collaboration in this official launch and to see where it grows from here. 
Um, so I would go into a bit more detail with the functionality of the platform and maybe illustrate a bit what uh, Eva has already introduced in terms of linking platforms, interoperability, digitization, how that actually works and function in this platform where the main architecture is, is now there and ready to, ready to be used. Uh, so the portal can roughly be divided into three main sections. The real backbone of the portal is, of course, the library of jurisprudence. Um, in contrast to these other portals, which it interacts with, uh, that focus on legislation or on MEAs or on treaty decisions, the real focus, of course, of this portal is on case law on jurisprudence. Um, so this takes the form of both the library that's publicly available, but also importantly, the, the digital architecture to be able to collect cases uh, from users of the platform. So the first is the jurisprudence um, uh, library, basically. Uh, the second component which was introduced uh, or mentioned by Justice uh, Antonio Benjamin is also very important to the, uh, to the collaboration between GGIE and, and U, uh, UNEP is the judicial network. Uh, so this is a space specifically for GGI members and GGI judges. Uh, to be able to discuss uh, and, and network and find each other. So it consists of a directory and of a forum. Uh, and lastly, the resources section, which Eva touched on, which is basically the library of information, of video lectures, of reports, of whatever content that's sort of a space specifically for GJIE to be able to find and host these resources. Um, so I would start then with the jurisprudence section. So I started specifically logged out to show that, that uh, the portal is a bit split between the public facing section and uh, certain elements that are specifically for people who are authenticated to either be able to contribute content or additionally to be able to contribute content as well as access this networking section. So if I want to browse jurisprudence, of course, that's publicly available from anyone who accesses the site. If I want to submit, uh, just to show you, then it, of course, prompts me to be able to log in. So then to be able to create an account, this would go then go to us, to the content managers, to be able to authenticate that user. So the idea was, of course, for judges and members of the judicial network to be able to share their cases, but additionally, uh, all other, other contributors potentially uh, prosecutors, uh, partners of UNEP with UNEP projects, with GJA product projects, um, regional UNEP staff members, whatever the case may be, uh, so that it really is a tool that has a broad reach to be able to collect and start populating uh, jurisprudence. Um, then additionally, if you try to go to the judicial network, you're specifically given a prompt where you need to be a member of the Global Judicial Institute, and then you can go to create an account that also goes to this this validation section where if you do say that you are a judge, there are some additional uh, fields that need to be, need to be filled, uh, filled out. And one last word in terms of the process of this and the pipeline of it, both uh, cases as well as users then go to the second step of authentication. So there's a bit of a workflow behind the scenes um, where, the, where the structure of the site is, is set up to be able to validate the people, validate the, uh, validate the cases that come in. So there's a quality control built in. So then if I go now to start with uh, submit jurisprudence and log in, I'll show you some of the fields uh, that hopefully concretize a bit what we mean by the linking between these platforms and the utility of housing all of this process within one platform and making it internal and digitized. So things like, so if I do this test case, so that the case I already know is there. Functions like showing you that there's already a duplicate. So you can see that perhaps someone's already added it or it's a related case that you can link to. Um, so then if I, there's a certain uh, minimum set of fields, of course, and then this is another very interesting thing to show. If I add the PDF file, so this is the, just the PDF of the decision of actually um, a UN uh, body uh, decision. Uh, but then I'll go down to this, which is another a very interesting thing, which hope it works live now, um, where it can actually extract tags from the glossary, which is really the value add, another value add of having within this digital platform. It will actually scan the PDF and give you suggestions from the glossary. So if you're not super familiar with the glossary yourself, it can already give you some suggestions, but you know the case. You can say, yes, climate change, that's right. Yes, admissibility, that's right. 
uh, civil procedure that's not really right, property that's not really right. So of course it's not perfect, but it already gives you, and myself knowing the case, it's actually fairly good, this, this individual tagging. Uh, in addition, you can add some uh, text to the key environmental legal questions or abstract, and it would also scan these fields to be able to give you some tags. And then finally, in terms of some of those many different fields, it can give you uh, specific hints so that you, the users understand what we mean by these individual fields. Uh, then at the very end, to demonstrate how this is linked to the other platforms. So if it's specifically about UNFCCC, let's say, um, then it will automatically pop up. This creates a link with a unique identifier uh, where the system knows that this is specifically linked to the record on Informia of uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, same for court decisions within the portal. So this is based on a previous Supreme Court quick case from New Zealand, and I can click this to show that it's linked uh, and that creates uh, a specific identifier in the back end. It kind of removes the human error if you type the case wrong and it, it captures this information a bit better. Uh, and then lastly, the idea is of course that this then gets imported to the related platforms. So we're not recreating the content types on each platform where Ecolex and Leap are already generating legislation. Informia already has these connections for MEAs. Uh, then the ju jurisprudence would come from here and we hope that so judges can still opt out, but in most cases, then it would, uh, it would naturally or automatically be forwarded to these additional platforms. Uh, just quickly then to see what the front end looks like, the publicly available side of jurisprudence. Um, you have, so these, uh, of course, the tags then you can see over here. So then if you collect, uh, select climate change, but then you can further narrow by this uh, legal specific glossary. So then if you want to more specifically about climate change evidence and narrows down to these two cases. If you select one case, this is the one that's already added. You can see how these tags are reflected and all the additional linked material. Um, quickly, I would introduce then the network as well. So uh, Judge Clement and, uh, and uh, Justice uh, Leverson were kind enough to create uh, uh, example profiles already, um, just to show this is what the directory would look like. Of course, it's not useful, it's just two judges. Um, but if you have uh, you know, a volume of judges, you can filter by the specific type of law that they've indicated they're interested in, um, as well as the name. And then just to show you quickly what a profile looks like you can have a little bit of an expert excerpt of your uh, biography uh, link to either decisions but hopefully decisions would be entered and you can see here uh, actually one of the all the jurisprudence that that user has uploaded um, the second aspect of the network is the discussions page um, so this is basically a forum it's three levels uh, the first level is basically the very broad topics so right now just for example so we call them forums I've created a broad form of human rights, everything human rights in the environment. Within that, you can have topics. These topics can be added by any judge user. So I've created one human rights and climate change. Within that topic, you can ask specific questions. And so besides this case that we were just looking at, are there other uh, cases brought on the light, right to life? And then you can have a back and forth basically discussion over here. So fairly light touch uh, forum, um, but it's there and it's, uh, basically available to these authenticated judge slash GGI users. Uh, the glossary we've already a little bit been over, but then the advantage of the same set of cases being on both Informia and on the judicial portal. On judicial portal, it's the same set of cases largely, except it's tagged against this uh, legal litigation specific or adjudication specific glossary. Whereas on Informia, it would be tagged to this more MEA specific everything environment uh, glossary. And uh, you've already showed you a specific glossary page. And then finally, uh, just rounding out, uh, we mentioned e-learning. So these then connect to the Informia portal. Uh, so these are what we think are more in, uh, specifically interesting uh, courses for judges. But you could also create specific uh, e-learning courses that are only available on the judicial portal, not on Informia. Um, but still using the learn, learning management system and architecture that we already have in place there. This is another way to navigate the courses that are in Informia. We have a space here for video lectures um, because I think there are a lot of those within uh, uh, GGI members that 
that often give addresses that are recorded that it could be useful to store in one place and then other e-learning platforms where we want to link to other platforms that are doing much of the same work. Uh, we have training materials, which is basically just PDFs, uh, a lot of UNEP um, uh, materials, but it's open to anything, UNEP and GGIE, or even just uh, uh, relevant to the judiciary. Um, similar, but uh, reports, not specifically on, uh, not as specifically on capacity building or training. Uh, partners, just to point to um, platforms that are doing similar work that, we're, that we don't want to replicate, where a GGIE in the portal is specifically for these GGIE members and, and material. Um, university still needs to be populated, but, uh, but it's in place there. And finally, legislation pointing to these tools that are more engineered specifically to navigate legislation, which already exists, which are already connected. It's the same body of legislation, but again, not to reinvent the wheel, uh, where if, you're, if your entry point is legislation, it's better to start from those tools. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and I'll hand it back uh, to Justice Leverison. Thank you. So <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Peter. And let's turn now to Marc Clément for his uh, intervention. Please, Mark, you have yes. Your... yes, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Is that OK? Yes, yes. OK. So. Um, Thanks a lot for um, the, in, in, the invitation. And um, this is uh, really uh, great to be part of this uh, big event and uh, especially the launch of this um, official launch of this uh, portal. I, I don't want to be too long, but I want to stress three, three points why um, and uh, indicating why is it uh, so important to share case law and jurisprudence for uh, judges and also to progress in networking in the domain of, of environmental law. First of all, and I, I, I won't be long because this is uh, probably obvious for everyone, that uh, the, the, there is an international dimension of environmental issues. Obviously, the planet is, um, is only uh, uh, one ecosystem and um, uh, one thing that is to be protected everywhere. And also, and I think that's why uh, UNEP is so useful in this context, uh, there are many international conventions. And as judges, we are basically using the same um, legal body of text uh, that is to be applied uh, across the planet. Uh, we, have, uh, we are facing common uh, issues as judges. For instance, uh, climate change is obviously one big uh, common issue, but uh, water pollution is, uh, is to be uh, tackled everywhere, air pollution as well. And um, so that means that per se, the exchanges between judges are very, very important. And that's also what we experience um, in the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment, where we had this um, uh, annual conference where we compare the way uh, judges um, are solving cases and, uh, and very similar situation across Europe, seeing big differences, but also big, um, big uh, similarities. Second point, which is very important, is uh, sharing means for us, for judges, uh, to find inspiration from other solutions. I just briefly uh, give an indication from, the, from Europe but uh, uh, we could probably find uh, so, uh, things uh, similar like that uh, everywhere. In climate change, we had, for instance, a very important Dutch uh, Supreme Court Dutch case uh, in, um, based on um, human rights applied in, um, in the domain of climate change. The uh, German Constitutional Court issued also a very important case in climate change, but which is based on constitutional rights and constitutional uh, courts uh, applied these constitutional rights, moving in the same direction as the Dutch court, but using different reasoning. And the French um, Conseil d'État uh, was also delivering a very important case uh, on the basis of uh, European directive and national laws. 
but we are we know also about um, there are many cases uh, in India in different uh, countries related on um, to um, air pollution or protection of biodiversity, and so having a tool as it was presented by Peter where you can identify easily for one sector uh, one um, a set of cases which is relevant to one area is very, very useful. And I think that um, the brief presentation of Peter uh, should um, be a way to, to, to be an incentive to, to go on the portal and to look at the different um, uh, at the database and to find that we have many many uh, relevant uh, case law which is already available and very interesting. And the last point I, I wanted to 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 say is that uh, the uh, portal is a way for each jurisdiction to promote some of the cases, the landmark cases that have been decided in each jurisdiction. This promotion is very important. We all know that some judgments um, are known by many people in the world, uh, such as, for instance, the Dutch case um, I mentioned in, on climate change, due to the fact that academics will comment um, these uh, judgment very extensively. But there are other um, and many interesting judgments and cases that are not covered by these um, uh, academics um, uh, discussions. And I think it's a pity that uh, we, we only focus on very specific uh, countries. And I think that for uh, the, the tool uh, that is provided with the Global uh, Institute uh, Judicial Portal is a, is a tool that uh, will allow uh, every country to, pro to promote uh, some interesting cases for the benefit of everyone. I see that if you look at the database as it is today, you, you will find a, a lot of cases from India, a lot of cases from Tanzania, and uh, they, this is very, very useful to have this global perspective. The Global Judicial Institute is a global institute. And it is not aimed at promoting specific uh, case law from uh, specific areas of the world. And I think that uh, the last message I wanted to, to share is that there is a need uh, specifically for Supreme Court in every country to uh, really uh, find a way to, uh, to, to, to provide cases to the judicial portal. That this is something that is not too complicated to do. As Peter has shown, um, this could be done uh, quite easily. And I think each uh, Supreme Court or possibly each court, but I think if the momentum is given by Supreme Courts in every country, I think this is a very uh, positive thing for everyone. And I, I really encourage everyone to share as much as possible what has been decided in every country that will be very useful for every judge um, in the world. So thanks a lot for listening. And that was my brief uh, intervention on that. Thank you very, very much, uh, Marc Clément. I don't know if the co-chair, meanwhile, uh, managed to be online, uh, Donald Ganyaru. Uh, he was not online at the beginning, I think, but I don't know if he's, meanwhile, has managed to join or not. Yes, uh, Donald Ganyaru is here in Stockholm. Ah, he's in Stockholm. Okay. <laughs> so I hand over now. Uh, to uh, Donald for his uh, final remarks. Donald Cagnaro, he joined UNEP shortly after it was headquarters uh, was uh, based uh, in uh, Nairobi. Uh, and uh, he uh, was uh, involved with different, he, he performed different functions. Uh, including that of uh, the director of the Division of Environmental uh, Policy uh, Implementation and much more. And after his retirement, he is still uh, very uh, active 
in the bodies like the World Commission on Environmental Law, the International Council of Environmental uh, uh, Lawyers. So, Donald, please, the floor is uh, yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, my co-chair. Uh, he has been uh, with me on uh, this road of uh, uh, <clears throat> sensitizing each other, understanding each other for a long time. And it's a pleasure to uh, take the forum uh, together. Uh, the, uh, it's time for questions, comments from the floor on the presentation so ably presented by the speakers you heard. And of course, you are in the spirit of uh, uh, bring ourselves together uh, to inform each other, to know one another, and to move forward together. It's a long way we have come, by the way. It is amazing. And the fathers of that development are here as we I'll close the meeting later on. I'll make a few comments that bring you up to date with the process starting 1996 and the first global judges symposium in 2002 in Johannesburg. For me, it is rewarding that in 20 years, these 20 years, you are on your 20th year, you are now mature. You know, over 18, you are now uh, free agents in this particular area. So it is rewarding to see uh, a number of uh, uh, those that were there at the beginning. I have here Antonio, whom you all know. I see a uh, uh, chief judge of the Land and Environment Court that pioneered this process in 1979 and is still going strong. And uh, of course, uh, I do remember the struggles we had with the United States to begin with. Uh, my friend Scott uh, Fulton there and Professor Dan McGraw would remember. Uh, and uh, of course, even in our own countries, we had people who were saying, no, you don't understand. Judges know, know the law, they know it all. So why? Do you be saying you are training judges? Said, no, 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 we are not training judges. We were doing, we called it symposium, we called it colloquia. And from then now, you are actually running with uh, the, a, a subject that was, hmm, was so, so at that time. Nobody had studied it. Um, we were not sure where it was going. But now we are up and running with it. So comments from the floor. So very briefly, um, before we have questions and, and comments on, uh, on the portal, uh, there is still a lot to do in terms of refining uh, the portal, but it's also uh, relevant to recognize the work that has been done, it's amazing. So congratulations to the colleagues, both on the UNEP side and on the Global Judicial Institute on the environment side. Uh, I would like to thank in particular the colleagues from the board that have been participating since the inception of uh, the idea. First of all, as I already mentioned, Luc Lavrissin and Marc Lemain directly involved Rangil Noe, uh, Michael Wilson, Brian Preston, and Mansoor Ali Shah, that will be arriving at any moment, and Ricardo Lorenzetti that spoke uh, yesterday. So now uh, we are hoping to expand the conversation as we move to the more sensitive part of the portal or the design and the implementation, which is the um, the segment that will be open only for us judges, our space. And uh, from the UNEP side, I would like to thank Inga Anderson, who has been very supportive, as I mentioned yesterday, of the Institute since the moment uh, she was still director of IUCN. 
uh, Elizabeth Merema, who was then uh, the director of uh, the law division. And Donald keeps uh, telling me and Elizabeth that he hired her. Uh, so he <laughs> selected Elizabeth. I will not say when this happened, but it was quite some time ago. Then in the division itself, Arnold Krajhuba, great supporter, Andrew Rain. Uh, I suppose Andy is connected uh, with us. He'll be, be speaking at the closing. Uh, more recently, Patricia Mboti, she was here yesterday and great supporter, very enthusiastic about uh, the portal and the wonderful team of two, Eva and uh, Peter. And originally it was Eva. So Eva, we would like to thank you and this large team for putting together such a magnificent product. This is really the cutting edge of what, as Donald said, of what we have been looking for and thinking uh, that it will be possible and now it is possible. So Nick, I think there'll be comments. Yes, thank you. Um, we have time for just one or two minutes of, of comments or questions if, if anyone has any questions they would like to raise. Please, Justice Preston. A question for Eva and Peter. Um, with the uploading of the judgments, it's really important, uh, as a number of speakers said, to have uh, representative judgments from all over the world, all jurisdictions, all languages. The only problem is, and I suppose this is uh, particularly for somebody like myself, uh, uh, who is not multilingual, uh, we find difficulty in accessing uh, the judgments if they're not in uh, one of the well-known languages. Now, sometimes courts have been really good in producing a unofficial English version of the uh, judgment. So in, for example, the agenda case, uh, they did that also in the uh, Norwegian uh, Greenpeace case, they did that as well. So my question is, uh, could both versions be uplifted uh, to the uh, portal so that people who are not fluent in Dutch or Nor Norwegian, for example, are able to read the unofficial translation. And the second would be, could there be any flagging of a translation of some of the more important uh, cases which could be uploaded? So if the court hasn't done that, uh, somebody could do it, because otherwise uh, a lot of us will miss out on all those words of wisdom that are in other uh, judgments. So that's just a, a question. Thank you. I will ask just one additional question that perhaps can be responded um, together with these matters from a, a questioner online, Maria Diane Rowland, who asks whether there is any possibility for creating an account in the judicial portal for non-judges or non-lawyers. Is, is that envisioned? Do you create an account for someone else who is interested in doing research on these matters? Um, or how does this work for a non-judge who's interested in looking at the information on the portal? Yeah, please. Maybe, maybe so, coming back to the <laughs> question of Brian Preston, I think more and more there are some uh, automatic translation programs uh, of which the quality is becoming better and better. And maybe we can consider uh, if uh, such a tool would be, be helpful to have uh, access uh, to to other other uh, uh, languages. But the second second question, I'm, I'm more reluctant, but I'm giving the floor on that to uh, Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin. Well, I would like to hear from both Eva and Peter, but just on the uh, question that came from a virtual participant, uh, the portal, as the name indicates, is a judicial portal. But early on, we agreed that part of it could be open 
to the public because it's also in, in our interest as judges that the public and especially researchers and those that are experts in, in the subject know what's going on in different jurisdictions globally. But the DNA is a portal by judges, for judges in cooperation uh, with UNAP. So we don't envision um, um, a portal accounts for others than the judges. Uh, the, the open part of the portal is open to everyone. You don't need to have an account. Um, but the part that is just for the judges, and that's the core uh, of the portal for us from, from our perspective, um, in that one, only judges and sitting judges, not even retired judges, will have uh, an account. Yeah, are there any additional comments from Eva or Peter on those on those issues? Um, maybe just yes to come in here that, uh, to say that, of course, even in UNEP, we are struggling because the translation into English, or at least even the summary in English of a case is already a high level task for which you have to have a high level of understanding. And that is why it is very crucial that we have a number of vetted contributors, often universities, because churches tend not to have the time to do this work. So there is uh, probably the option to have a contributing role through an institution with a vetting role of the Global Judicial Institute. Uh, and I think we would find a solution that would uh, you know, suit all of these. And I wanted to say on the tagging, the, 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 the system is multilingual. So the five UN languages are possible to pick up the issues in the five UN languages. But of course, as soon as it's a non um, UN language case, we are depending on the summary that comes with the case. So this is just a small practical uh, intervention. Thank you. Um, we have time for just one more question. Justice Wilson, please. Uh, thanks, Nick. And thanks very much, Eva and Peter. I just wanted to be clear about the relationship, if any, with the established databases for legal research, such as uh, Westlaw. It's my understanding that the judges are being uh, asked to do the analysis of those cases that are of significance and that uh, that would mean the judges are the source of information and the analysis of, for example, which cases from Westlaw should be included. Is that correct? Maybe that was a hard one. Maybe, maybe I can ask, can uh, respond to the question. So, uh, of course, this is an open source uh, database. So uh, it's not possible, I think, uh, to copy or, or whatsoever uh, jurisprudence from more commercial databases. And uh, we can harvest on the basis of, of uh, uh, databases of the courts themselves and so on. But I think it's impossible uh, to, to import or, or whatsoever uh, any material from commercial databases where you have to, to, pay, to pay for it. Yeah, if I may compliment, because this uh, question was raised early on, even before um, we approach UNEP. Um, as we know, in many countries, there are commercial uh, data banks. And Mike mentioned uh, Westlaw, which is probably the largest in, in the world and is operating not just in the United States uh, anymore. So there was uh, the suggestion um, from colleagues that once we have the portal um, fully operational, including the, the part that will be open and accessible only for judges to contact Westlaw and other uh, companies of that type and see whether the judges, 
the, uh, that are members of the institute could have free access via the portal to the data bank of Westlaw, but not importing uh, Westlaw uh, cases into uh, our data bank. So that's still um, pending because we need to finalize the, 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 the part of the portal that is just for judges. Well, thank you all very much for those questions. And I'm sure there are many more questions about the operation of the portal. So um, I imagine that uh, the colleagues at the UN Environment Program would be um, willing to be contacted by email or otherwise with additional questions that you have. Um, so in the interest of time, I, I think we'll need to, to close in order to move on to our next panel. But I'd uh, like us to all uh, give a round of applause to our chairs and uh, panelists for this presentation. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to head to, and to uh, call our next panel, which will be on theory and practice of the environmental rule of law with special emphasis on independence, integrity, and the use of technology in the judiciary. And as co-chairs of this panel, we have Veselina Haralampieva, Senior Counsel at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and Carl Brook from the Environmental Law Institute. So I'd call them to come forward. I also would like to invite uh, speakers, Justice Suntaria Muanpawang from uh, the Vice Chief Justice of Region 5 from Thailand, Justice Karen Zarikian, Administrative Court of the Republic of Armenia, Justice Samson Okongo, the Presiding Judge of the Environment and Land Court of Kenya, and we have joining us online, uh, Federal Judge Marcos Livio Gomes, from the National Council, National Judicial Council of Brazil. Um, and I will turn the time over to our co-chairs, Veselina and Carl, to introduce the panel and provide an introduction to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real honor to, for me to be here today. Um, it has been a fascinating series of panels and discussions of uh, dignitaries from around the world. So I've learned a lot and I think there has been so much um, ideas for further collaboration and really insightful thoughts on sharing innovative legal instruments, uh, practices, case law. So on this very topical, very um, important panel today, it's my uh, privilege to introduce first uh, Justice Ontaria Mwanpong who is Vice Chief Justice of Region 5 of Thailand. Hello and welcome to the panel. Uh, Justice Karen Zarikian, um, who is at the Administrative Court of Armenia. Hello and welcome. They're uh, joined by Federal Judge Marcus Livio Gomez from the National Judicial Council of Brazil. Uh, virtually. Is joining us virtually. Um, and uh, we will have also uh, Justice Ambang Kandakasi, um, Deputy Chief Justice from the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea. No? That's on my agenda. So maybe there has been some updates on the program. Okay, okay, so he'll be joining us um, later. Um, and um, with my co-chair, uh, we will um, turn first. Okay, um, so Justice Samsung Okongo from the presiding judge of the Environment and uh, Land Court of Kenya. And my uh, co-chair, Carl Brunch from the Environmental Law Institute. Well, so with this, um, I'll turn over first to you, Justice Antaria Mwanpong, and thank you. Justices, judges, law professors, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so honored to be here with you all in this historic, historic uh, event. Um, 
Today, this morning, I would like to share our experience from Thailand. Um, actually, I have PowerPoint. Uh, someone will, okay. So, uh, yeah, we are talking about theory and practice, and I'd like to choose a topic on, on intellectual integrity of green judges, and would like to share my experience and my uh, ideas. So next slide, please. Um, first of all, I'd like to show our uh, environmental problems in our region, especially in Thailand. Uh, I'm not sure you have some ideas about the country in Southeast Asia. So uh, Thailand is developing, has been developing uh, for, you know, in the, in the Western direction. So we learned a lot about the industrial uh, problems. And uh, although we have many, you know, richness in natural resources, so the fair and just uh, allocation seems to be seem not to happen well in Thailand. So uh, you can see that uh, during the development of industry, so we have got many kinds of pollution and uh, this affects uh, not only the people but also the wild animals or forests. Uh, we have uh, the rich and the poor, we have also uh, minorities or uh, indigenous people in the forest and sometimes uh, mostly uh, when uh, the problems happen it's like uh, uh, impact to the the people who have like intersectionality of uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, actually, after the Stockholm uh, declaration, Stockholm conference, only six month, uh, six years, we had uh, created the uh, the law on uh, environmental protection and we set up like a body, an agency to preserve uh, the en environment. So it means we had uh, this kind of agency for more than uh, uh, 44 years already. And uh, last uh, 25 years, we had the constitutional uh, rights, uh, constitutional provisions which uh, confirm the right of the people and not only the individual right, but also the community right. Uh, it means uh, the community uh, uh, can have access to justice, uh, no, access to natural resources, and also they have rights to be heard or even uh, the EIA and HIA process uh, uh, were confirmed in the constitution. And Absolutely, we had created many good uh, laws and regulations. Next slide, please. So, and our uh, environmental law enforcers, we have, I think every country, we have police, we have uh, uh, environmental law enforcers. So we have like department of uh, forestry or the uh, fishery or, you know, uh, factory, uh, industry department, something like that. And we have public prosecutor, we have court and uh, uh, enforcer for to execute our judgment. Next slide. Yeah, and in our judiciary, I'd like to say that uh, I think more than 15 years, I went to visit uh, Justice Preston with our senior justices from the Supreme Court. So at that time, we learned uh, the experience from the Australian court because uh, we heard that uh, Justice Preston and his, you know, uh, senior justices so created the uh, Land and Environmental Court, and it was the best model. At that time, I went also with uh, Justice Puno, you know, uh, and later he became the uh, Chief Justice of the Philippines. So two groups of uh, Thai and Filipino uh, judges uh, learned together. And after that, when Justice Puno came back to his country, so cre he created like uh, the uh, Supreme Court rule to regulate and to have like a uh, uh, 
practice and procedure in his court. Also in our country after that, so we created like the green bench in the Supreme Court. And so now until at uh, that time until now. So we have like green bench in the, not only in the Supreme Court, but later in all uh, 10 uh, appeal courts and in some uh, ordinary court, court of the first instance. And later, so the administrative court, uh, they, they separate from our court of justice. So they also have like a green division in their court also. And so we try to have like uh, created like a green jurisprudence and um, try to uh, develop our educational program and we have a uh, good collaboration. So we met uh, many of you uh, beforehand because we have not only the internal collaboration, but also international collaboration and networks. Next slide, please. So, but today I think uh, when you want me to talk about the general environmental rule of law, so I thought that uh, maybe I should select only one and the most important topic. So I think that for Thailand and maybe for many countries, it would be very important because uh, I think if apart from the problem of corruption or something, yeah, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Justice Benjamin said that, oh, we don't need an uh, activist judge. But for me, activist judges are very needed, you know, and it's mean, it doesn't mean that we need to protest or something, but I think we need to reconsider about our integrity. And integrity doesn't mean only like uh, corruption or not corruption, but it means that we need to have like intellectual integrity. And this is like the, we, from the ethical, you know, court, we need to be active and proactive to protect the people and the environment. So, uh, this is from the dictionary, you know, <laughs> Integ uh, intellectual integrity means uh, you need to be honest to learn the fact or the truth in your case, and you must try to reach uh, the best decision. And you must uh, have a driving desire to follow reasons and evidence uh, courage courageously wherever they may lead. And you must, uh, you know, uh, manifest intellectual integrity value objectivity and evidence-based decision making and courageous fair-minded and complete the process to pursue the best possible knowledge in any given situation i would like to explain more about this uh, next slide please so i think uh firstly when uh if you want to talk about uh uh you know the the environmental justice in some country uh, like Thailand, which has like a big gap between the poor and the rich. So uh, many people many uh, said that uh, the prisons are only for the poor, you know, <laughs> prisons are only for the poor. What does it mean? So if uh, we talk about the land encroachment, no? uh, encroachment in public land or in forest land, so many people <laughs> encroach the public land, not only the poor, but maybe the privileged, you know, the politicians, uh, the mafia, <laughs> uh, or, you know, like the rich, but only the poor uh, were enforced, were arrested, or, you know, mostly, and not, not only, but mostly. So, if the court cannot understand this uh, social situation, so how can we set the fair sentencing guideline? So this is like, uh, we need to be uh, wise enough now who uh, came before us and when uh, the inequal society, you know, uh, brought only the poor to our court, yeah. And about the uh, environmental ethics, you know, you talk a lot about the ecological uh, centric, no? eco-centric approach. Um, in Thailand, actually, we had more than uh, 20 years now that uh, uh, we, the, the, the uh, Environmental Protection Act uh, confirmed uh, about the in ecological uh, compensation or the value of the nature. And, uh, who destroy the nature must pay. You know, 20 years later, nothing happened, you know. <laughs> we just uh, consider this this paragraph, this uh, provision that we need to to apply this, you know. And 
I think firstly, we did not even understand what's the meaning of the value of the nature. But later, if we, you know, try hard to, to understand <laughs> this, because this is the ecological centric, you know, approach, and it's, it's, it's not un easily understandable for judges. And firstly, so we try to, to calculate. Uh, you might heard no, uh, one uh, black panther was shot dead no, by a rich, privileged uh, guy. And so uh, not only the problem that uh, he should be arrested or not, no, but later we talk about the value of the tiger, the, the black panther and the uh, uh, public park department want uh, 12 million baht, but uh, the court gave only 2 million baht, something like that. So what's the meaning of the this idea? About the polluter pays principle. So every time when the factory uh, discharge uh, contaminated water, something to the, to the public not, uh, land, something like that, not only the factory will sue, but you know, the government agencies will sue. So it's like, uh, it's not finally, so the, the department must pay and not the factory or both, no? But finally, it, it's not the uh, polluter pays principle, but it's the taxpayers pay, pay principle. So I think this kind of things now that we need to revisit and rethink, you know, what uh, we should have like to uh, try to develop our jurisprudence and try to understand uh, the real problem in Thailand. So finally about the, I think we need to dream of the problem solving court. I think we talked a lot also yesterday that after the judgment, what would be uh, happen next? Uh, and I think that about the execution of the judgment, enforcement of the judgment until now the court stop our work uh, with when we write uh, the judgment, we finish the writing, no? But actually there are many things to be done and we need to do more. So I thank you all for your attention. And I think uh, I learned a lot from these uh, events, uh, not only now, but you all are like our role models and I am so respecting you all and I wish you all have a great job in your work and yeah, we will work together in the near future. Thank you very much. Honorable colleagues, dear friends, I'm happy to be here in Stockholm, in beautiful city, despite of the weather, and uh, to speak on the topic of uh, environmental law and the efficient role of judges uh, in securing our planet. It is impossible to overestimate uh, the impact of judges on environment policy on both international and national levels. We judges have a power to control the process of both making and executing environmental rules in the context of the rule of law. I think all of you agree that the process of the evaluation uh, of legislative rules and executive uh, regulations turns them from soulless text into the uh, real effective law. Even international uh, conventions and declarations need to be recognized, uh, interpreted and implemented in a particular case to become a true part of a legal system. As Professor Robinson mentioned uh, yesterday, many of them, uh, including uh, Stockholm Declaration, would remain merely as a good idea if the courts did not bring them to life by their decisions. We judges should uh, profoundly realize our responsibility in the process of the exercise of uh, environmental law and take our right place uh, among other actors. Uh, of course, politicians have a primary position because they make uh, initial uh, political decisions considering environmental issues. We can see that many of these issues uh, don't, uh, don't reach the court and political decisions has, does become conclusive ones. But if just one individual or non-governmental organization brings a case to court, it might have 
crucial impact on the whole subject. When deciding a case, it is up to the courts to decide either political decisions meet legal standards and principles, protect human rights on clean environment, and establish fair balance between concurring interests or not. This function of just fair monitoring of environmental law can be performed only by judges due to our independence and impartiality. When making decisions on various issues, including such as environmental uh, matters, politicians cannot ignore the political reality, pressure coming for public expectations and international relations. In most cases, politicians primarily evaluate the political consequences and uh, of made decisions because the latter obviously uh, affects their popularity, raising or lowering uh, ch uh, ch and chances to be re-elected uh, next time. I consider to be quite a significant problem the fact that political decisions of, uh, on environmental matters don't always become an object of critical public attention, uh, particularly because of its specific difficult nature. Ordinary people not included in scientific environmental researches are both rarely informed uh, and don't really rely on the uh, professional opinions. It makes environmental political decisions not properly challenged by public, uh, by society members, members, which I consider to be a dangerous uh, trend that can lead to various manipulations in decision-making processes. Meanwhile, an adequate and thorough reflection on the environmental issues usually requires unpopular decisions that politicians are not always willing to make. On the contrary to political decision-making process, principle of independence and impartiality that underline judicial branch mean that judges are able to act without any fear of being criticized, not only by politicians, but also by public. Acting, acting of, on behalf of justice and people, we are often out going against public opinion to properly protect human rights and establish fair balance between different interests. At the same time, the power to cancel decisions made by political bodies, independent from decision makers and public opinion, puts an unprecedented uh, responsibility on us. It, if politicals keep in mind that their decisions can be revised in case of any need and in the end corrected by the court, we, on the contrary, are deprived of such a privilege and have to act being aware of the final nature of our decisions. Besides, as I have already mentioned, we may not find the public support for the decisions being made, remaining alone with our beliefs and priorities. In order to handle these difficulties, we should be aware of the environmental situation in the whole world and not being limited solely to legal knowledge of existing environmental regulations. We are all to get acquainted with environmental scientific reports, statistics, prints and predictions, etc. We should carefully listen to experts being able to conclude whether they are more or less persuasive, thereby dealing with environmental matters and environmental law require us, requires us to have the appropriate outlook knowledge that will allow us to make a responsible, balanced decision, taking it to, into account its global consequences. In other words, legal knowledge should be supplemented by humanitarian one. This brings us to the necessity of special trainings for judges who deal with environmental cases. As I tried to show, the basic knowledge of judges is not enough to function proper in the complicated sphere. 
First, we need to promote more frequent meetings in order to share our knowledge and experience. But it is also important to have trainings on a regular basis, both, both on national and international levels that should be held by law and environmental experts. These kind of events will not only provide us with appropriate professional skills necessary to deal with environmental cases, but also with crucial feeling of confidence when facing the problems mentioned above. At the same time, I realized that it would be quite difficult to train all the judges who are in charge for uh, deciding on environmental matters. The organization of judicial to, ju ju judicial trainings requires a lot of human, financial, and technical resources. For example, there are overall 23 uh, judges dealing with environmental cases in my court and 10 more judges in the Court of Appeal. I consider it to be unproductive and merely impossible uh, trying to train all of them, especially taking into account the fact that uh, there is an electronic distribution cases uh, of cases that currently operates in Armenia uh, that makes it impossible to predict whether you are going to deal with uh, environmental case or not. In conclusion, I want to say that I think that effective solution in case of Armenia might be the uh, implementation of specialization judges of judges. If only, for example, three judges, uh, official level specialized in dealing with the environmental cases, it will be enough to solve all such cases in our Republic. It is obviously better to have uh, six specialized judges instead of 33 judges of general jurisdiction in case when they have all necessary uh, skills to decide on environmental matters. I'm happy to inform you that the, some discussions on this matter are currently taking place in Armenia, and I hope that we will have this special, specialization of judges soon enough. To be honest, I'm not quite sure if there is a similar approach in your countries and whether it would be handy uh, for you as it seems to be uh, in case of Armenia. So consider my observations as a kind of opening room for discussion and I will be happy to hear your comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Justice uh, Zakarian. That's already one comment for the Q&A session. So, <laughs> and the specialization of judges on environmental matter. With this, I will turn to uh, Justice Samsung of Congo, please. Floor is yours. Good morning. In uh, the topics, uh, the impact of, of Stockholm Declaration in shaping global environmental law and jurisprudence, theory and practice of the environmental rule of law with special emphasis on independence, integrity, and the use of technology in the judiciary. I'm going to just share with you the application and enforcement of the environmental rule of law in our jurisdiction. I'll consider some challenges we are facing and I will conclude. There is a consensus that uh, a, a gap exists between uh, theory and practice of environmental rule of law. While environmental laws are now in existence in almost all jurisdictions world over, in most of the countries, they only exist in uh, what I would say in paper. 
in uh, my country, Kenya, where I believe that uh, we have some of the best laws and mechanisms for the protection of, I believe we have some of the best laws and mechanisms for the protection of uh, the environment. We have a, a very progressive constitution that guarantees a right to a clean and healthy environment. We also have a framework law on environmental management and coordination in addition to other sectoral laws. Our constitution also makes all treaties and conventions on environmental law to which Kenya is a signatory part of the Kenyan law. We also have a specialized court dealing with only the environment and, environment and land disputes. Also, we have a tribunal established under the framework law which handles disputes relating to development planning. However, best laws and mechanisms for enforcement of the environmental laws which are undertaken by the government are in effect best laws and mechanisms for enforcement of environmental rights have however not translated to perfect environmental protection. In some countries, the, in, uh, the implementation and enforcement of environmental laws which are undertaken by the government are ineffective. In others, the laws have no structure for effective implementation. So in Kenya and the neighboring countries in East Africa, we have a number of cases that illustrate the environmental rule of law in action. I will highlight them briefly. One of the cases, I would call it the Serengeti case, where an NGO called Africa Network for Animal Welfare sued the Attorney General of the United Republic of Tanzania. And the case was filed to challenge the intended construction of a tarmac road across the Serengeti National Park which the applicant contended would have serious environmental effect in the Serengeti National Park and the adjacent Maasai Mara National Park in Kenya. The, there was a contention that uh, the, action, the action was against the East African Treaty, the Rio Declaration and the Stockholm Declaration amongst others. Uh, the Republic of Tanzania argued that uh, it was within its rights as a sovereign, na a sovereign nation to make decisions for socio-economic development, such as construction of the road. Also, it contended that it had hired environmental consultants who had advised that negative environmental impact associated with the project could be mitigated. However, the court found that uh, the Republic of Tanzania had in intended to construct a road across a public national park and that from the evidence on record, the, uh, the adverse effects of the road could not be uh, mitigated. So the court actually restrained the United Republic of Tanzania from continuing with the, with the construction of the road. The other case which is in Kenya is uh, a case where the residents of Islam in Kenya and uh, claimed that uh, their right to a clean and healthy environment had been violated by the construction of a lead acid factory within the residential area. And that toxic waste from the factory caused deaths and illness among the villagers. Uh, several ministries in Kenya were sued in that particular case together with the owners of the factory. The petitioners, the contention by the respondents were that uh, the slum dwellers had chosen to stay in an area which was polluted. So they had exposed themselves to the, 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 the pollution. However, the court found that uh, the Slum dwellers' right to uh, a clean and healthy environment 
was violated and the court awarded the petitioners a sum of Kenya shillings, 1.3 billion uh, Kenya shillings, which is about 1.5 or so uh, US dollars. Another uh, case, uh, I will just go quickly. Another case is uh, of, in, uh, of interest in Kenya is, I would call it the toilets case. This is where the petitioners argued that uh, the respondents had infringed on the right to a clean and healthy environment. of commuters using Kenyan highways. The petitioners argued that uh, lack of toilets on the highways forced commuters to relieve themselves in the full glare of the public or in containers that are then flung out of moving vehicles. The respondents sued a number of authorities, the Council of Governors of Kenya, the Kenya National Highways Authority, uh, then there is the Kenya Rural uh, Roads Authority. The, co the court found that a clean and healthy environment included physical infrastructure and road aesthetics. And the court also found that the constitution obligates the state to eliminate activities that are likely to endanger the environment. The court found further that people relieving themselves in bushes and other open spaces was one such activity. The court also found that the road authorities are empowered to provide necessary amenities for users of its services and facilities. The court ordered that a working group be constituted to formulate a policy for the provision of toilets and other sanitation facilities on the country's road network to give effect to the right to clean and healthy environment. We have also had another case uh, I would call it the Nairobi River and uh, Dandora dump site case. In this case, the petitioners alleged that the respondents had violated their right to a clean and healthy environment and sought orders compelling the respondents to adopt a precautionary principle in preventing the upstream and downstream pollution of Nairobi and uh, Earth rivers, as well as restoration of the rivers. Uh, because there was uh, a dump site next to the two rivers, the dump site used to pollute the river. So a suit was filed by the residents that uh, the pollution of the river endangered their right to a clean and healthy environment. And the, count, the court found for them. The last case due to time that I would mention is... Uh, uh, a famous case, we call it the plastics case in Kenya. The government had banned single-use plastic carrier bags in Kenya. A suit was then filed to challenge the ban. And uh, the matter went to, came to our court, the Environment and Land Court uh, uh, of Kenya. And the court found that the, the ban of single carrier plastic bags uh, by, uh, procedurally and substantively, uh, they, it did not violate any law. Uh, and uh, the court of interest said that uh, the government secretary for environment had power to issue the Gazette notice as the state was constitutionally required to eliminate processes and activities that are likely to endanger uh, a, health, a clean and healthy environment, which is the highest form of right in the hierarchy of constitutional rights, uh, because that right is a sustainer of life it, in itself, in the trajectory on which all other forms of rights gravitate. Uh, moving quickly, I will skip this. My time is running out. There's the case of uh,
There's a case of uh, Patrick Kamoto and Gidinji and four others uh, versus uh, residual center prices. The petition had moved the court to stop the construction of a road next to their residence on the ground that the works were being undertaken illegally without environmental impact assessment. And uh, the petitioners accused the respondents of indiscriminately cutting down trees which were providing shade and fresh air to the residents. In the ruling, the court accepted the petitioner's contention that the respondents had indeed violated their rights to clean and healthy environment. The court also agreed with the respondents' contention that the petitioners had submitted no specific scientific proof that the ailments which were allegedly being suffered by them were as a result of a road project. The court held, however, that in the circumstances of the case, it was inappropriate to, it was appropriate to apply the precautionary principle which is also referred to as in dubio pro natura. The court stated that in a case of doubt, matters should be resolved in a way most likely to favor the protection and conservation of the environment. In the final order, the court stopped the construction of the road in question until environmental in fact assessment was undertaken and the petitioners uh, concerns addressed. I, I'm sorry, my time is up. So thank you very much. Let me stop there. It was a long paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Okongo, for this very detailed and, and useful uh, summary of some of the um, Kenyan uh, cases relevant to today's topic. With this, I would like to turn to our virtual participants, to um, the federal judge, Marcus Livio Gomez, do you hear us? Are you with us? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Justice Hamlin Benjamin for inviting me to participate of these events, these wonderful events. So my main goal in this presentation is to, to, to give an overview of the Brazilian judiciary initiatives in order to tackle deforestation and illegal mining. In fact, the National Council for Justice is trying to, to support Judd and Kurtz with, with tools in order to improve the hearings, improve the actions of the judiciary against deforestation, against illegal mine, uh, supporting prosecutors and many other institutions that are involved in environmental law and climate change law. I will share a presentation in order to guide my, my overview. Can, can you see that? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Just one second. Let's go. I will present, I will present the Serene Jude. Serene Jude is, is a tool developing by the National Council of Justice uh, in partnership with United Nations, uh, United Nations, Brazil Judiciary has an international cooperation with United Nations uh, program of the of development, and involving uh, the lab of ODS, we are trying to 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 to, to introduce this new tool to be used by judges and courts. This this Serene uh, June is is included in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Serene uh, June observes the following sustainable development, mainly uh, climate change, life on lands, and peace, just and strong institutions. All work that is being done by Brazil is focused on uh, moving on side by side the United Nations uh, 20. 2030 agenda. But what is data judge? Data judge, to put in perspective, the, de the degree of complexity of this initiative, the National Justice Database is a centralized database that contains metadata of 300 million cases 
consider painting and the close, closed ones. Uh, it was used to identify an environment related case in each court of Brazil. Uh, within this environment uh, team, there are almost 1 million lawsuits, 1 million, pending and closed, considered all the time series that started at 2015. DataJude contains metadata obtained from currently more than 300,000 judicial cases. Sirene Jude, as used a subset of DataJude, is reaching a million cases cases considering the pending and concluded on since the beginning of the time series. But what's the main goal of data judge, of Serena Jude, in fact? We can see in this screen, for instance, the main interface of Serena Jude. In this right, in its right, there is a menu that allows the user to select one of the many layers that contains environment data such as deforestation polygons, indigenous territories, traditional occupied lands, protected and reserved territories, national parks, private sites, mining location, federal roads, water bodies, and several more information that are being constantly improved and collected in a regular basis. Also, some of these layers are dynamically and continues updated by data mining boats and data gathering algorithms. In this screenshot, we can see the red and orange area, which represents the deforestation identified by remote sensing methods, specifically using satellite satellites that monitors periodically the Brazilian territory and can provide information about the forest coverage. These images are compared to using machine learning tools to spot changes between old images and updates ones, and a polygon is automatically drawn and plotted in the layer. Each one of the black spots are judiciary units, courts that have a case law of environment case and is organized by its geographic coordinators. So, any interested person or citizen, uh, the platform is open to public, uh, can assess the, this information, click in the black spot and obtain the specific metadata of each one of the judicial cases that exist in Brazil that are related to environmental issues and the climate changes issues as well. This is updated daily and anyone can download the full spreadsheet or this shape file containing the polygonals and attributes. Yes, uh, everyone will be able to download the information that is uh, provided by Serena Jude. It allows that the judge and the public prosecutors see the exact location of the land that is being discussed in judicial case and identify territories that are relevant or protected by law so it can be taken in consideration during the trial and the decision process. Due to its continental size, Brazil territories often contain a large social and natural complexity that must be geospatially identified to be perfectly understood. And a specific deforestation are, for instance, can be protected by federal, state, or municipal administration, and its features must be foreseen. Serene Juni is a rel relatively recent project, but it's always involved and involved in the team that maintain its in the national concept of justice is always implementing new tools, uh, layers and data visualization interface to provide a better tool to the society. Some recent features can be seen here, like the integration of the Serene Jude with the federal prosecutor data about class actions. Uh, from now on, uh, the judges and the federal prosecutors can be exchanged information uh, remotely and online, updated information that can be shared by, to be used by in, in trials uh, and, and court decisions. With this data, it's possible to visualize where the environment damage effectively occurred and not only the judiciary unit location where the the case is being processed. 
Each one of the damage can be viewed in the Serenjuri interface and when clicked, it displays the case number. This is an important information, the proceeding type, the curve and the other useful information. Uh, it is a mix of geographical and judicial metadata that will be disposed for the society. In this screenshot, for instance, we can see the full description, description of the case metadata and attributes that are currently available in Serenjuri, such as the environmental themes that con it contains, the name of the judicial stance, instance, the proceeding st status, some <clears throat> timestamps, and the name of the litigation parts, if they are incorporated components and not natural persons. The system automatically filters information about natural person to maintain its privacy, but shows the information about corporations. Also, Serene Jut allows the use of several filters to refine search, such as ear, curse acronym, uh, justice segments, among others. Each att attribute can be filtered and combined with others to, so the user can easily access the part of the information they actually need using filters and layers that is being disposed. In addition to the geographical representation, of the maps by clicking on data panel, general left side menu, it's possible to see some panels, dashboards, with statistics from the data database, such as total number of process, number of process in progress, number of state and current case. Data Judas was developed based on free software. And this is an important information because uh, 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 if using a free software, we can share this tool with any other country that would like to use the uh, form in, in their cards uh, and allows the consumption of different data source through web service, enabling the inter interoperability of that data from different institutions. The layers are programmatically updated by data mining robots that read the websites and APS for public institutions that provides the data source. It is done in a database and aims to provide a table formats, CSV, and in special layer formats, shapefile, in a machine-readable way for a final user. All, one of the new features are the, of, of Selene Jude are the automated reports. What are the reports? Serene Jude nowadays provide automated reports to the courts and to the judges created periodically using judicial national database, data judge. It can help the courts case management, identifying constraints in the proceedings and excessive delays. The target users and stakeholders are the judicial agents and the judge itself and prosecution service. It contains, the report contains case load per court and states, aggregate numbers about the pending case and timeline, average rolling time per court and per judge, a ranking, uh, comparing courts by every procedure duration and many other information. In the next screen, we will show the new layers that we were recently inserted in the issues. One of the team is the integration with the Federal Prosecutor Service Initiative that is called Amazonia Protege, in English, Protect Amazon. It is an initiative where they have mobilized a task force that aims to combat illegal deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon forest. With a new work methodology, which uses satellite image and cross reference of public data, the prosecute service open public civil actions against those responsible for illegal deforestation with more than 60 hectares uh, resisted by the project for monitoring deforestation in the legal Amazon. Uh, this initiative opened 1,000 public civil actions against 2,000 defendants of, for illegal deforestation and illegal mining in the Amazon in mapped polygons of more than six, six hectares that were deforestated between August 2007 and December 2019. These actions charge more than 
almost $1 billion in compensation for damage caused related to recovery of 200 hectares of degraded forest. So uh, going to the end of my presentation, I have many other uh, slides to present, but I think that the most important is, is uh, understand the, 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 the new the new tools uh, and the update of Serene Jude. Serene Jude also employed new tools like the polygon creation tools in, 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 in polygon formats. It is required to do it to the normative resolution enacted by the National Council of Justice and the National Federal Prosecutor. This measure has the objective to clear, identify the damage area and allow complex calculations like the sum of the area currently in the dispute in Brazilian judiciary, the average area in the most affected states and municipalities. Also, we must explain that if the new judiciary policy for environment uh, protection created by the resolution of the National Council of Justice. So next steps, closing my presentation, what we are aiming to do. Uh, in the middle of this year, in July, I think, uh, I guess we will be improving Sirene Jude are in the integration with initiative related to artificial intelligence. One of them called, is called the Codex. Codex is a data management platform that supports the use of AI and judicial policy. Currently, the justice AI models are available on the Synapse platform, which congregates Brazilian courts initiative to share and leverage solutions, which contains more than 41 AI projects and the other thematic models are going to be inserted in this platform. Related to the environment initiative, having more effective and useful data with information management is essential to sustain God's good AI models with a consistent degree of accuracy and precision. The future projects are initiatives that and partnership that are already ongoing are the ones with the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte to develop models that can classify cases related to this topic. Also, we are hoping to create algorithms that can also identify cases that are related to climate change imp impacts. The future in environmental topics are the extensive use of these tools so we can fully understand the top if a judiciary data approach. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, can I have two minutes? Marcos Livio, many thanks. Uh, can you put uh, the map of Brazil with all the dots so I can uh, say something in addition to what you have just said? Well, first yes. of all, many thanks to Marcos Livio, a federal judge that with his wonderful team at the National Judicial Council of Brazil is doing this fabulous work. It is the most, you have never heard me saying this type of thing about my country. I am usually, you know, sort of negative, and this is the most sophisticated judicial system in the world for the control of deforestation. But this doesn't mean that deforestation is controlled because we don't have the tanks. We are not the police. But at least we can show where deforestation is happening uh, with real time satellite data, we can show, and it's transparency about us, the judges, where the cases are, for how long they have been there, the name of the judges, unfortunately we, we judges in Brazil cannot hide and say, you know, don't, don't publish my name. No, the name is there, federal judge, state judge. And then look at this map because I want to explain something to you. 
for the first time, we judges and Chief Justice uh, Luis Fuchs wanted to present this to all of you, but he couldn't come. This is his uh, creation. And, um, but it's important that we show what exactly we see on the map. For the first time, we can see that the area in the Amazon, which is the red uh, on the left, the northwest part of it, that's the whole Amazon. You see how few dots we have. And you can click on those dots and you go all the way down uh, to even the picture of um, the location where the damage, the deforestation happened. And then you look uh, at Sao Paulo. Marcos, you can show this in a, in a second. Go back, please, uh, to the previous one. Uh, and then look at Sao Paulo and Rio, the number of suits protecting not the Amazon forest, but protecting the Atlantic forest. Also very important, very even more critically endangered than the Amazon. And then you go to the south uh, of Brazil, the Pampas, other biomes, look how uh, effective uh, the, uh, judicial implementation is. And my home region, the Northeast, the protection of the coast, the dunes uh, as well, and the Atlantic forest. But in the Amazon, and we are talking about an area the size of Europe, um, we now have in front of us what judges are doing or not doing, both at state and, and federal courts. So it is a transparency tool. Uh, it's also an integration tool. Um, the government, the federal government cannot deny us the information. So it comes, it feeds the system automatically and... Um, I am very proud of it. So congratulations to Marcus Livio, to the Chief Justice Luis Fuchs and the whole team of the National Judicial Council. Thank you. And this is truly impressive. Um, uh, uh, Judge Banks, Bankson and I were in uh, Colombia uh, convening a series of symposia on deforestation. And uh, there's, <laughs> no, it was deforestation in the Colombian Amazon. And it, um, there's, there are no tools like this in Colombia. It's, uh, this is, this is really impressive. It, it did, that, that experience though, raised a question that I think goes to the heart of this panel on integrity and rule of law, environmental rule of law. When we got out of the capital, when we got into the rural areas, we started hearing multiple stories of judges being threatened. That a lot of the deforestation, a lot of the land grabbing was linked to organized crime. And this is a country that has seen 60 environmental defenders killed in three months, the first three months of the year. So when a judge gets threatened, it's, uh, it's, it's not an idle threat. And we struggled with what to tell the judges. I mean, we're trying to give them the tools to uh, issue decisions. But what do you tell a colleague who in issuing a decision puts his life or his family's life on the line. I'm very curious if you, you have any experience or perspective on this, because this goes fundamentally to the ability of judges to fulfill their roles and to achieve environmental rule of law. Any thoughts? Please. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I did some uh, research project on environmental justice. And so firstly, the people asked uh, what kind, what are the uh, 
the environmental cases. And so mostly when we think of follow the international standard, so it's like a administrative uh, cases or you know civil liability or criminal law. And actually in our country, there are many environmental defenders who were killed. Um, murdered yeah because of the environmental campaign or fighting yeah so i think this is uh, this is sad but it's it's a real story that happened all, all the time in thailand and also about the uh, the role of the ngos um and and the work with the communities you know sometimes the real uh, villages uh, uh, in the rural area they cannot understand even the language so how can they have access to justice or how can they have like a big campaign to to against the projects so i think the ngos or the civil societies try hard to work with them but now our government tried to initiate a new law to control, <laughs> you know, uh, they want like NGO governance, you know, so they want to, and mostly so they, the NGO, environmental protection NGO, so they work with the international partners or they were supported by the foreign uh, NGOs also. And so sometimes uh, maybe it's like a, the government uh, fear of them or something like that. So, you know, uh, so I think uh, it like uh, intellectual integrity actually is not only needed for for judges, but actually is for government. You know, they need to understand what what is the big picture and, and who protect the environment uh, when the state or the uh, officers cannot do it on their own. So let the people do. And when the people are not are weak, no, not not so strong enough. So they need someone to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, not a big problem in our jurisdiction, uh, particularly with regard to judges, but there is uh, last year when one environmental activist was actually murdered in a place called Laikipia. So with the judges, it is really not a big problem. Uh, the problem we have, I hear, as I had mentioned in my presentation, we have a great constitution, great environmental laws, but uh, among the challenges that I was going to mention, if I had time, was that not many environmental cases are finding their way into court. So most of our very hotly contested cases where li lives are on the line are really political, but not environmental. But of course, what I've seen they do in uh, uh, political cases where the life of the judge is on the line is to actually beef up, beef up security. But it's not really in environmental sphere not much. Thank you. Um, please. And if there are any questions online, I don't have access to that. But after, after this justice, please. Um, good morning. I really enjoyed the presentations, especially of uh, Judge Gomez from Brazil. Uh, so I have a couple of questions uh, for Justice uh, Judge Gomez. Uh, my understanding, because I look at technology in my courts also, and I think it's critical, uh, AI and uh, machine learning and technology is very important for courts. But I think the essence of technology to courts is, and I just want to share that idea, is that uh, we could uh, have better reforms. We have data. Number one is collection, collecting, uh, you know, uh, verified data. Secondly, it could lead to reform. And thirdly, it improves your governance, judicial governance. That's what technology helps do. So uh, that's what we are working on in Pakistan also. But this is an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, technology that I've seen. So the question for Judge Gomez is that are you in a position to identify how long does a case take to be decided? And can you sort of, by looking at this data, tell me uh, what has been the case which has been the longest, uh, which, which took the longest in uh, being decided? I mean, uh, the, the life of a case, can you, can, you, can you give us an indication that there are cases pending for maybe last six months, for like six years, five years? Can you, can you uh, through this software, find that? I, I would be very interested in knowing that. And secondly, the data that you collect, 
Uh, is there a central repository system where you have the entire data for the country and you can sort of then uh, go into it? Is, is there a location for that data and it's, it's central? My third question uh, relating to the software is that, could you explain a little bit more on the data mining robots that you mentioned? How, how does that really work? And what are the possible the algorithms that you plan to develop uh, under the AI to identify environmental cases. My problem with identifying environmental cases is that most of the cases that come to courts do not really, people are not articulate enough to explain what's the environmental problem. And it is at times for the judge to identify what the environment is. The two cases out of Pakistan that have come do not mention that it's a climate change case, but the judge can smell it and can tell that it's a climate change case. So how does the artificial intelligence and technology tell you that whether at all it's an it's an environmental case because you said you can identify an environmental case how do you identify the environmental case judge gomez i will be very interested thank you please please go ahead judge gomez all right uh it it was an interesting uh question so how long in fact, we can we can split the problem. Uh, the technology is one of the one 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 of the solutions is a part of the solution, but it's only if technology uh, we won't be able to tackle deforestation in illegal mining Brazil. Uh, we need support. In fact, uh, environmental needs support from the federal government and especially the state governments in order to tackle. Uh, illegal activities, special uh, invasion of indigenous areas, and, and they're all. One third of the Brazilian territory nowadays is occupied by indigenous areas and uh, protected areas. So one third of the ter territory. And there is a, a really, really aggressive uh, movement of the agro, agro business uh, going to the forest. Uh, it's not only one state of Brazil, Amazonas is one of the states, but uh, in the illegal Amazonia, we have nine states and in at least four, five of them, we are facing problems with the moving of the agribusiness and going directly to the forest. So, uh, trying to answer the questions, uh, how long? Uh, the average, the average in 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 the courts is three years. Uh, federal judge, special federal judge. This this the, these issues uh, is most common in federal area in federal judiciary, and we have an average of uh, three years to have everything done with the, a final decision of the, the, the of the courts. Uh, going to the National Court of Appeal, uh, there are a few cases in the National Court of Appeal, the Brazilian National Court of Appeal uh, regarding environmental law. Uh, it, can, it can last uh, much more, but uh, mainly uh, and the average in, in, the, in, the court, in the federal court is three years. Uh, the second question is about the database. In fact, uh, Sirene Jude is trying to get information by Public is data sets. Uh, we have uh, currently eight, five public data sets that is being uh, included in Serenity Jude and creating the layers in order to be able to filter the, the most important information. And so uh, the information, the, uh, the search of the information is not centralized in the, the National Council of Justice in the judiciary. But now we can, we are able for integrate the, the information data uh, in, in, in this system, uh, updating daily. And the third information, uh, but it, it's not only, uh, it, it's important to say that the judiciary is creating a data lake with more than 300 million lawsuits, uh, including environmental law as well. Uh, in the third question, the last one is about robots and algorithms. I, I'm not a, I'm not a, an expert in IT, uh, but 
currently I'm really involved in, in issues regarding IT. Uh, the team involved in IT in the National Council of Justice nowadays is about 200 people that is being hired and being uh, that's being hired by with the support of the United Nations Development Program. Uh, one one of the teams, uh, Alpha team, is working on environment law in Serene Jude's, and this ongoing project involving AI is about to classify uh, class actions, to classify lawsuits. In fact, as as was told, uh, the the defendants or the prosecutors, in fact, the prosecutors in Brazil can classify the case like uh, climate change, uh, environmental law, illegal mine. But many times we can see uh, mistakes in classifying the gloss, lawsuits. And the, the main idea is that the system, the AI and the robots and algorithm will try to, to check, to check out the information uh, done by prosecutors in order to understand if the information is right if the lawsuit is is is, is co correctly classified and creating lay layers in order to be able uh, to, 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 to have this information easier to the society and to the judge. I think that's uh, it, it's a, a really really fast explanation. I I would like to know if is there any other question please. Um, because I know there will be other questions, but I'll give you, uh, Marcus leave you uh, email and WhatsApp. Uh, and he's very, very quick in, in, in responding as opposed to me. But uh, a couple of um, comments on, the, on, on this. First of all, as you saw, it's a very sophisticated system. And unfortunately, this cannot be replicated in other countries where courts still work with paper files. In my, um, uh, in the Brazilian judiciary, now 100% of the cases are uh, electronic, including uh, the evidence, absolutely everything. So we can then use into, in, um, artificial intelligence for, um, for gathering information that might not be climate change, be used in the, 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 the judgment itself, but is in the expert's uh, testimony. And, and, and the system can, uh, can do this. Um, in your question about uh, how long it takes, well, first of all, for the, um, now we have a system in which uh, judges are, will be exposed, are exposed, and are exposed not just to society, but to the National Judicial Council that has disciplinary um, powers. Uh, so it, it's not just something, oh, my name is there. No, no, it, there will be uh, repercussions. Uh, and also, in um, when this, uh, this is happening, we have to understand that when uh, and, and here we are talking about both criminal and civil, uh, and that later on I'd like to discuss with Thailand to see if you also have both, because I understood you mentioned several times uh, criminal uh, law, but here is for both criminal and civil. Uh, so sometimes we have a suit that is filed, and what the plaintiff really wants, the federal office of the attorney general, is not immediate restoration, but to block that piece of land out of the market. And this is immediate. It cannot be sold. It cannot be uh, circulated in the market because is uh, within uh, the judiciary and nobody will buy that. Um, and then even if it takes three years, four years, um, the longest, um, uh, case is from Sao Paulo against the biggest um, uh, industrial complex, petrochemical complex. This lawsuit was brought 30 years ago. But you know what happened in those 30 years? Appeals one after the other, the biggest law firms in the country blocking everything 
And what is was asked in by the plaintiffs has now been achieved. And several of those plants shut down, restoration uh, done, people fired. So um, this also is reflected in the system. Okay, and yeah. then um, Justice. Yeah, is this microphone, oh, great. So uh, Justice Santeria, a question from Georgie. I expect it's Georgie Lloyd <laughs> of UNEP. She says, thank you, Justice Santeria. What do you think needs to be done in Thailand to encourage judges to ensure execution of a judgment or enable proceedings to enforce it? And I'll just ask the second question because I think that can be uh, answered very quickly. Another from uh, Marina Yanush. Uh, thank you, Marina. Uh, she says, thank you very much for presenting the impressive um, Serenejud tool. Sorry about my pronunciation. I was wondering if there is consideration to include citizen science and crowdsourced data from the public. So perhaps if we start, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I might suggest that we take the, the series of questions and then okay. uh, that people respond. So uh, Justice and then Michael. I think it's better we get the uh, questions out first and then the panelists can try and answer the questions for us. I'm very fascinated with uh, IT. I chair the IT case management and IT committee of the PNJ Judiciary. We've moved into e-judiciary as the next uh, project. We will go completely paperless. That's our contribution to preserving the environment and, and uh, everything that we are here talking about and the challenges that we have faced. Rather than the judiciary taking a judgment seat, we need to do something. And I think the judiciary um, has made, and I think Brazil is taking the leadership to go e-judiciary. And that becomes paperless we will save a lot of forest. So my challenge to all of us present is if you are not yet fully uh, e-judiciary, perhaps that's the direction we should be taking. Now, my question is uh, we lack in the area of data, raw data that Brazilian presentation has shown. The idea, what I'm trying to get to is if the, um, I think it's the satellite base um, zooming in on areas, that's the technology or the ability we like to adopt. Is there a way that we can be able to share that link up? Uh, we're working with an Armenian um, uh, technology company and everything from filing through to final disposition, you will know where is the dead end, who's locking up. So I manage the system at the moment. So the cases that are held up, we intervene right away. It should be moving. And the um, objective set by the judiciary is within 12 months of filing, case should be disposed. If there's a delay, we need to account. So uh, those are things, the technology is very uh, encouraging, but uh, we need, I need to find out how we could uh, um, interlink and share the technology that is evolving to be able to, to move our judiciaries to the next level. So that's a question of just linking up. How do we go from here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Justice Wilson. Uh, thanks. Let's see if I can get this out of here. Thank you, Carl. And aloha to you, Marcus. Uh, thank you for your great work. Um, and obviously, this is an exciting area for all of us having to do with gathering of the data that's now becoming available to explain just how effective a judicial culture is. But with respect to the issue of the murder of environmental defenders, which is the, the Global Judicial Institute's been quite concerned about. You alluded to it too, Carl. It's a the idea of applying the rule of law in a way that's effective to protect the planet, to protect those people that are actually giving their life during this period of time that's so important to try to keep the earth from overheating. The idea of being able to protect them through the rule of law with the integrity, as the justice from Thailand has mentioned, could depend on using the database to identify the murders and to do so wherever we have electronic uh, data. So if, if we're lucky enough to have it in Colombia, for example. So I, I am hopeful, Carl, that we'll, I, Marcus, excuse me, that we would be able to maybe have a working group of the Global Judicial Institute that can start focusing on the murder of environmental defenders and utilize this database in Brazil, perhaps, as a focal point for that working group. 
but thanks for your work. Aloha. Any final questions before we turn back to the panel? Okay, uh, one quick qu comment before I hand it over to the judges. I may have a solution on the data side. Um, uh, a, a colleague works at NASA and um, NASA collects a lot of data and they want to get it into the hands of people who want to use it. And one good thing about NASA, all the data is free. The European Space Agency commoditizes data <laughs> and NASA is all free. So it's a question of how do you access it? How do you process it? I'd be happy to hook you up with the right person after this. Um, but uh, maybe start with uh, Justice from Thailand. Yeah, thank you uh, from the question from Thailand, our uh, Georgia. So uh, I think uh, we talked a lot already about the execution of the judgment, but until now, because of the lack of the legislation uh, is not so clear in the law, uh, after the judgment, how can the court play more role? So I think uh, firstly, maybe we need to review our laws. Uh, uh, Environmental Procedure Act. Actually, we tried to have the draft already, but it's still in the political <laughs> conflict on that. And also, uh, maybe uh, I I think uh, we we learn uh, the good model from maybe New York. It's like uh, uh the the problem solving court. Actually, it's for the juvenile court or uh, women domestic uh, violence law. However, I think if we believe in this kind of model, you know, so the court can play a moral in, in to execute uh, the judgment. Thank you. And then Justice Livio, I think there were a couple of questions for you. All, all right, enforcement uh, is, is something that is not easy in any part of the world. Uh, one of the one of the one of the goals of the of this project is uh, aligning technology with the enforcement as well. And so, what we what we what we are trying to do, in fact, uh, the partnership with the prosecutors, federal prosecutors, will be able to to include uh, the polygonals uh, of 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 the lawsuits, the class actions in the map, and then. Uh, with the polygonals that has already been uh, identified by the prosecutors, uh, the judge will be able to use this data, this information uh, directly in the lawsuits. So, in fact, the main idea is not to need, for instance, to an expert to do an assessment of the damage because we will be able to see the damage online. And this information uh, we'll be able to use, we has already been legislated about that. Uh, this information will be, will be able to be used in the lawsuit directly online, the polygonal, uh, online information from satellite and everything. Um, I think that this is really innovative and can change uh, the way of the enforcement of the lawsuits uh, regarding environment law and climate change as well. Thank you. Uh, Justice Okongo. Uh, yes, uh, uh, if I may add on uh, the issue of enforcement, uh, we have a challenge also, but uh, we have adopted a number of ways to deal with the with the problem. One of them is that uh, we issue what we call structural interdicts, meaning you don't make a decision and leave it there. You actually monitor and supervise enforcement. So that is one of the ways we have actually tried to deal with the problem. Thank you. What did you call that? Structural interdict. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Be, be, this is a this is an issue in a lot of countries, and I'd love to follow up with you on that. Uh, regarding the execution of decisions uh, of the courts, uh, I, I want to say that it's a uh, rather uh, important uh, issue, of course, because the access of uh, justice and a right of fair trial uh, is not limited just to bring a case and uh, get a uh, ju 
decision of the court uh, and uh, Article Six of European Co uh, European Convention of Human Rights uh, provides uh, for a right of fair trial, which as uh, many times the European Court of Human Rights mentioned in its case law, it's uh, uh, included the execution of uh, decision. So it's uh, it's uh, very important to uh, have an to have an effective system of execution uh, decisions. And I can say that there are many problems uh, of execution of decisions in my country, but uh, thank to God, it's not uh, it's not uh, regarding of uh, environmental cases. So uh, because of uh, type of these cases, because if uh, court decided that, uh, decided that uh, the appropriate ministry uh, did rightly uh, rejected some permission or other or uh, give permission with uh, violation of uh, laws, it can be executed very effectively. Uh, so it's uh, there are not much pro many problems in this sphere. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been an incredible panel. Uh, maybe would you like to say a final word? Thank you, Carl. Um, I think we are taking into the uh, time for the break, for the wellness break, but uh, this has been a fascinating panel. I think that uh, we have uh, discussed uh, relevant questions starting from integrity, um, intellectual integrity, but also um, the threat to judges, right, who are working on, on these very important um, matters and upholding the environmental rule of law to technology and to enforcement. So um, I would like to thank everyone for the participation and uh, most of all our judges um, for their insightful uh, presentation. So a round of applause to all of you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much to our chairs, with Selena and Carl, and to all the speakers. Um, given that we are a little bit behind on time, uh, we'll not take a full uh, break. Rather, you may do so individually if you need to step out for a moment um, to get a snack or use the, the restroom. There are uh, some food and drink items just right outside this side of the, of the hall. Um, so thank you again to uh, everyone on this panel and... Uh, I'll go ahead and call our next panel to take your places here <clears throat> on the stage. Our next panel here will be on access to justice, nature, indigenous peoples, and environmental rule of law. And we'll go ahead and start it uh, immediately, especially since uh, we have uh, several colleagues who are joining virtually. Uh, so our chairs for this panel are Georgina Lloyd, Regional Coordinator for Asia and the Pacific of Environmental Law and Governance from the UN Environment Program in Bangkok, and Marina Janusz uh, of the United Nations Commission for Europe in Geneva. Uh, so they'll be our co-chairs, and I would invite uh, to come forward speakers that we have on this panel, Arnold Kreilhuber, Deputy, Direc Deputy Director of the UNEP Law Division in Nairobi, who will be joining us virtually, Justice Joe Williams of the Supreme Court of New Zealand, also online. Uh, and then we have two speakers here with us in Stockholm, Kristen Walker, the Chair of the IUCN Commission on Environmental, Economic and Social Policy, and Professor Dan McGraw of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. So please... Uh, Dan, Kristen, and everyone online. I'll turn it over to our co-chairs, Georgina and Marina, to, to get us started. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. And can you just confirm in the room that you can hear me? I will take that as a yes. Um, good afternoon. Good morning. Justices, judges, and distinguished representatives, and uh, welcome to the panel of session six, which, as Nick was just saying, will explore access to justice, nature, indigenous peoples, and environmental rule of law. 
I'm delighted to be co-moderating this panel together with Marina Yanush from the Aarhus Convention Secretariat of UNECE. So yesterday, during the 40th anniversary celebrations of the Montevideo Program on Environmental Rule of Law, we heard from environmental human rights defenders who are the stewards of nature and the front line of environmental protection. Many of these EHRDs are Indigenous peoples whose lands, territories and resources are threatened by relentless unsustainable development, which places profit over planet, ecosystem health and ultimately threatening the ability for future generations to have access to nature and healthy ecosystems. We've heard already in the panel that just preceded this one about some of the threats that are facing environmental defenders. The failure to reach not one of the 2020 Aichi targets is reflective of the biodiversity crisis. Also, the ongoing harassment, deaths and intimidation of Indigenous peoples and other environmental defenders is also symptomatic of the biodiversity crisis. So this panel seeks to explore the role that access to justice as a critical component of environmental rule of law places in addressing the biodiversity crisis and the serious and disproportionate impacts that Indigenous peoples face when nature is threatened. SDG 16.3 calls for states to promote the rule of law at the national and international levels and ensure equal access to justice for all. While everyone should have access to justice, we must work particularly hard to ensure that groups at greater risk of injustice are protected and are able to exercise their rights, hold duty bearers accountable and advocate free from intimidation for a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. I'm sure that our panelists will, within their interventions, look to the Escazú Agreement, perhaps to the proposed post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. However, my question is, what more needs to be done to ensure access to justice for those who are seeking to fundamentally change the trajectory of destruction of nature? And to answer that question and to give us many other answers, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. So we will start with Arnold Kralhuber, who is the Deputy Director of the UNEP Law Division in Nairobi. Then we will hear from Justice Joe Williams, followed by Kristen Walker and Dan McGraw in the room. So without further ado, let me turn to our first speaker. Arnold, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Georgie, for this uh, lovely introduction and uh, great to see so many familiar faces uh, from Nairobi in the room in Stockholm. I wish I could be with you all, uh, but uh, it, is, uh, it is very encouraging to see this uh, judicial symposium happening. Honorable judges, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to speak at this important symposium, which is of course held in uh, conjunction with the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. Judges, as we've heard over the past sessions already, play an essential role in analyzing and contextualizing the emerging influence of environmental human rights. This corresponds with the worldwide growth in independent uh, judiciaries or courts with jurisdiction to hear constitutional matters and advance new constitutional rights and access to justice. Courts can ensure the security of environmental defenders and support effective continuity of their work. Across all regions, courts are vindicating rights in a wide variety of settings from mining to water and air pollution, and new rights are continually being recognized. While many courts have expanded standing in environmental suits upon recognizing the monumental challenges of environmental protection, courts are continuously facing new issues related to their role in protecting environmental defenders. UNEP's upcoming report on environmental courts and tribunals, for example, will outline that strategic lawsuits against public participation or SLAP lawsuits are usually brought by claimants on non-environmental grounds, meaning that these cases would be heard in general courts. Therefore, if general court judges are not privy to environmental issues, they would fail to connect the genuine environmental concerns that the non-environmental lawsuits seek to overshadow. 
This failure to identify an environmental slap case means that it is not dismissed for injustice. Not only does this failure lead to dangerous and traumatic consequences for the environmental defenders charged, but it also substantially impedes environmental justice and protection. According to the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, at least 355 slap cases were filed from 2015 to 2021. 224 of these even involved criminal charges, most of which were for libel or other defamation charges. Because environmental defenders play an important role in upholding, implementing, and advancing environmental rule of law, their legal rights and lives must be rigorously protected by courts. And this point speaks to the continued efforts that we need to make to increase judges' understanding about environmental issues and also the objective of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, which is so pivotal that judges have the necessary environmental understanding if these courses uh, come before them. This is a week, and indeed a year, which invites us to celebrate the environmental movement and its achievements. The many governments, people and institutions that have contributed over the last five decades to making the Stockholm Declaration a reality for people and for the planet. This is also a moment to celebrate environmental multilateralism, its highs and lows, its opportunities and its challenges, and to advance the conversation on how we continue to build the, on these achievements and lessons over the next five, 50 years. The last 50 years have demonstrated an impressive record of environmental achievement. Much more is being learned and done to protect the health and the environment. If 1972 was the year of bolstering the human rights and the environment linkages, the task for the global community since then has been to follow through on the great commitments taken by all actors. Despite how far we have come in the last 50 years, serious challenges continue to threaten these achievements. The triple planetary crisis is front and center of these challenges. Where gaps exist between law and practice, many actors have stepped in to secure rights related to the environment. From grassroots activists, indigenous people's communities, and environmental human rights defenders, many stakeholders are speaking up for environmental action. This action has not been without consequence, at times resulting in successful outcomes for communities and the protection of natural resources, but often resulting in persecution, criminalization, violence, and killings of these groups and individuals. We have the framework in place, but 50 years since the Stockholm Declaration, we still have some way to go in, in creating an enabling environment for environmental justice and environmental action. As environmental conditions throughout the world become graver and more complex, litigants are increasingly using rights-based approaches to environmental protection and access to justice, and courts around the world are responding. The Stockholm Declaration has paved the way for greater efforts to link and promote human rights related to the environment, and this is evident from the many positive contributions of environmental defenders in protecting the environment over the last decades. But there are further areas that must be strengthened to enable greater protection for environmental defenders and promote environmental rule of law. The kinds of harms that environmental defenders have been, or that have been perpetuated against environmental defenders over the last few decades implicate basic rights, including the right to life, to freedom of movement, the freedom of speech, assembly and petition, the right to the due process of law, and the right to live with human dignity, as well as criminal violations. There have been some incredibly useful tools that have emerged over the last 50 years to help secure these rights, and which should be used to prevent any forms of attacks against defenders. For one, international, regional, and domestic law, as well as the most fundamental principles of law, encourage participation in governance. In the specific context of environmental protection, international, regional, and domestic law has gone even further to protect rights of democratic participation over the last 50 years, thanks in part to the Stockholm Declaration. And regional human rights bodies followed suit, establishing the value of procedural environmental rights, access to information, public participation, access to justice, and effective mechanisms for implementation and enforcement. First in Europe with the 1998 Aarhus Convention, and then in the Americas with the Escazú Agreement adopted in 2018 and which entered into force last year. There are also efforts underway in other regions to understand the needs for similar agreements in these regions. 
At the national level, procedural environmental rights are also protected in an increasing number of constitutions. This is very encouraging, as these provisions usually complement substantive environmental rights as well as procedural constitutional rights. Environmental action has benefited human rights and collective safety of communities across all regions. But I'll say it again, environmental defenders need our support. In facing ever increasing complexities regarding our planet, people everywhere view environmental rule of law as central to addressing challenges of environmental justice and the disproportionate environmental harms suffered by already socially, economically, and politically overburdened communities. When we ask ourselves, why do people risk everything they have to protect the environment and those who live in it? The answer lies perhaps in that it is a matter of human dignity to exercise democratic rights for all purposes, including to secure the right to live in a healthy environment. And because the law in principle promotes, supports and protects those who exercise their democratic rights in this way. The criminalization and increasing attacks on environmental defenders are clear violations on environmental rule of law and an affront to these rights, roles and contributions of indigenous peoples and civil society in protecting our environment. Last year, 227 murders of environmental defenders were reported. Once again, the most dangerous year on record for environmental defenders. What will these reports look like by the end of the decade? When attacks are nonviolent, they take the form of litigation. And I have already referred to slap lawsuits, which are increasingly being used to intimidate environmental defenders and to convert public interest matters into technical private law disputes. In addition, pervasive impunity and lack of accountability for crimes against defenders makes the situation more precarious, making the case for increased efforts to strengthen environmental rule of law even more urgent. Environmental defenders, many of whom are indigenous peoples, are often sentenced under vague charges of treason, subversion, or even terrorism, are held in harsh conditions and are at risk of being sentenced to death. Some have also died in prison after being given long sentences. The key goal for all of us, in my view, is therefore to ensure that we will not be sitting in a room, virtual or otherwise, like this one in the future, debating the lessons of a failed decade. This decade until 2030 is crucial, not only for the SDGs, but for determining a better and more just and sustainable future for us all. At the national level, there are a number of actions that have shown to promote strengthen environment rule of law to enable the participation and protection of environmental defenders. What are these? High level statements of recognition of the important and legitimate role of defenders acknowledging the threats that they face and commitment to their protect protection. Laws for the protection of defenders which mandate effective protection mechanisms and which contemplate the specific needs for, of rural, indigenous and environmental defenders special prosecutors for crimes against defenders, effective regulation and accountability for business actors, and lastly, consultations with environmental defenders to establish plans to tackle the root causes of the risks they face. Countries which have acted on these suggestions provide encouragement to others and signal an even greater role for judges in the protection of environmental defenders going forward. I don't have the time to go through all the examples, but let me just mention that in Colombia, the law on protection of defenders can be seen as a good practice example, which includes specific provisions within the general criminal code to respond to the fact that attacks and offenses against human rights defenders are frequently perpetrated by a consequence of their work and that human rights defenders are at a greater risk than many other groups. In the UK, the Charities Act of 2011 specifically recognizes the work to advance human rights and that it's a, an area of work of public benefit. In Uganda and also in the Philippines, the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act or uh, the, the Involuntary Disappearances Act, you know, impose very clear duties on the state to protect human rights defenders. And you can find similar examples where increasingly the threats that uh, environmental defenders uh, face are, are um, you know, treated and responded to by specific national legislation. And this is very encouraging. Other examples of countries that have gone on this path include Sierra Leone, India, Australia, Canada, and Mali has recently also drafted 
a national law on human rights defenders. In concluding, let me just highlight again that over the past 50 years, the judiciary has played an increasingly critical role with regards to environmental defenders. And this role is likely to increase. And whatever national legislations uh, can provide in terms of additional tools, resources for judges to perform this role, this will help the international community drastically in terms of responding to these increasing threats that environmental human rights defenders face. But judges in essence can protect defenders by simply doing what judges do, adhere to the principles of rule of law, remain vigilant in situations where people are threatened and insist on civil and criminal accountability of those who threaten them. The aspirations that projected the environmental movement into prominence 50 years ago are alive and inspiring today's generation, many of whom are also identifying as environmental human rights defenders. And the message from today's defenders is clear. Tackling environmental challenges demands an intergenerational response, both from those who will inherit this planet and those who be created to them. The judicial, this judicial symposium and indeed UNEP's work with judiciaries across all regions demonstrates the strong contributions of judges in dealing with the triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss and pollution and waste. It has shown us the judicial commitment in building a healthy environment more, for more peaceful, inclusive and sustainable societies. At UNEP, we are determined to continue this engagement with you and judges across all regions to make environmental rights work for everyone everywhere and to contribute to the recognition and protection of environmental defenders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arnold. And I'm I'm somewhat in the dark now because uh, SCAP has decided to turn off the lights. <laughs> so I apologize if I'm a bit dark. Um, but thank you, Arnold. And you highlighted a few really vital things such as um, slap suits and the need to have perhaps rules of procedure in place for environmental matters, for environmental cases that seek to, to prevent slap suits being brought. Um, amongst many other important points that you raised. But let's now turn to Justice Jo Williams uh, from the Supreme Court of New Zealand. Jo, you have the floor. Uh, kia ora, Georgina. Tēnei te ara kei runga te arau rangi atu nei te arau papa e takoto nei. Tēnei te arau rangi rāo ko papa e takoto nei. Kia ora rau te tapu ai o tāne ki raro nau mai te pō tēnei te ao tihe i Māori ora. Uh, this, the, the brief prayer I just um, recited is uh, used when something new is being launched and I'm going to try and translate it. Um, it goes, it's something like this. This is the path to my father the sky, this is the path to my mother the earth. The words I utter help bind my father the sky to my mother the earth. I stand before the sacred footprint of my uncle the forest and I bid farewell to the darkness and welcome anew the arrival of light and understanding. I am going to take a slightly different tack, I think. Uh, I, I want to talk perhaps not so much about um, access to justice, but what is justice in the context of the environment? Um, and it's 10 o'clock at night in my country. So I'm going to do it with a little less energy than I might have done if it was 10 o'clock in the morning. So bear with me, please. The system of law that I grew up with in my country in New Zealand was one introduced by Western settlers. It had some, has some fundamental predicates. One is the idea that there is a central and impersonal government unrelated in any familial sense to those it governs. 
Second is the idea that the individuals within my country have autonomy and separate dignity and therefore rights. The third idea is that the relationships the humans in my part of the world choose to have with one another are in theory at least freely entered into by means of contract. So thoroughgoing is the idea of contract that in fact the promise to marry somebody was until about the middle of the 1970s an enforceable contract, the breach of which could turn you into a defendant in a court case. So relationships were between people in my country and in most other what might be called Western countries were arranged and organized by means of contract. And the relationships between the people and the environment were encapsulated in the idea of property. It followed from all of that that nature is a separate thing to be subdued and conquered. <clears throat> now, over the period of colonization, the West decided that those peoples on the earth who did not share those ideas were backward and that they needed civilizing. They needed to be saved and ironically, in the process of saving those people, the Westerners got to take all their resources too. That philosophy of a contractual um, approach to human relationships, of the deification of the individual, and of an impersonal and disconnected government, are now seen as deeply problematic. The discussion in the last, uh, by the last speaker and in the last session about um, mortal attacks on indigenous people and other environmental defenders is a discussion that's been going on since 1492. It is not a new discussion, it is itself a phenomenon of colonization. The Amazonian indigenous peoples are not the first to be caught in its trap. They are in fact the last of thousands upon thousands of indigenous nations treated in the same way over the last 500 and some years. So let me contrast that with um, something I do know about, the Māori approach to humanity and the environment. First of all, the idea of an impersonal government is, in my culture, rather strange. The idea that a judge is not your uncle or your aunt is rather strange. The idea that an individual is fully autonomous with no obligations and no necessary connection to a wider group is rather strange. The idea that one's relationship with other individuals is defined by freely entered into agreements rather than by kinship is rather strange. And the idea that your relationship with the earth, the water, the forest, and the creatures is defined as a relationship of property rather than a relationship of kinship is rather strange. So in my culture, the world hangs on the idea of kinship. You heard in the incantation my father, the sky, my mother, the earth, my uncle, the forest. 
in my culture, the water is an ancestress. In, she comes in many forms and her genealogy is well known and often recited. In my culture, the mountain is an ancestor and his or her genealogy is known and recited by those who belong to him or her. One of the most famous river tribes in my country, the people of Whanganui, say this, mai te kahui maunga kia tangaroa kuau te awa ko te awa kuau. From the distant mountains all the way to the sea, I am the river and the river is me. So, nature is not nature in my culture. Nature is me and I am nature. We are not a disembodied binary, but a single holistic being or series of beings. Now that means that what might be called nature in Western culture has in my culture certain rights and obligations. And judges like to talk about the rights of nature. But that's not really the indigenous way of looking at their place in the world. Rather, the relationship between the humans and the environment is a relationship of mutuality and negotiated coexistence. To speak about rights and obligations between myself and the environment is like speaking about rights and obligations between a parent and a child. In theory, they exist, but in reality, they are so inherent, there's no need to talk about them. And of course, that set of mutually negotiated coexistence-based obligations and rights are backed up by rules and values. These ideas in my country are slowly finding their way into the structure of our environmental law. So the river that I talked about, the Whanganui River, I am the river and the river is me, has been recognized as having legal personality in some recent legislation in my country. Now, of course, in Western thinking, that's an incredibly radical idea. But in Maori thinking and in indigenous thinking, it's utterly orthodox and has been so for thousands of years. It's just that the Western law is catching up. In my country, the largest river system, the Waikato, is jointly managed by the central government and the river tribes. And the river has, hasn't stopped flowing. In my country, one of the densest forests in the Northern Island, the Urawera Forest, has a recognized legal personality. None of the birds moved out. These environmental components, you might call them, these places with which indigenous peoples have deep, intimate, kin-based relationships, have become stakeholders in their own right, have become, in a sense, a, a second form of citizen. Here we are just exploring, just beginning to explore the implications of integrating these Maori custom law approaches with Western forms of environmental management. And it's too early to say whether that integration will work or not. But one of the challenges is for judges to come to understand not just the colonizers view of relationships with the planet and with each other, but the indigenous people's view of relationships with the planet and each other, because they too are now a part of the law. We've started with a few environmental components, I guess, that have been recognized by our legislature as having 
legal personality. But it seems to me inevitable that over the next generation, the idea of icon iconic environmental components having personality will seep into our general law, either through the legislature or by, ju by judicial pronouncement. The government last year announced a new policy on the all important environmental component of water. The interesting thing was that the policy was named Te Mana o Te Wai, the dignity of water. A deeply Māori idea, a deeply indigenous idea, seen as resonant not just for the indigenous minority in my country, but for all. So, it seems to me that if we are to speak of access to justice, then we have to understand what justice is. And the process we are going through in my country is redefining justice so that it is not Western colonizing justice, but the integration of indigenous knowledge and values and Western science. This is important because the process we are have been embarked on now for, I guess, 20 years or so, and we're still only beginning, is the process of decolonizing our environmental law and in the, in the process, producing true environmental justice. Perhaps that's a good point to stop. Tēnā koutou. Thank you so much, Justice Stevens. And um, I think the point of giving priority and to customary law and recognition to customary law is an incredibly important perspective that needs to be captured further across the region and, and globally. And as you said, it's a matter of laws catching up, uh, the, the Western colonized laws catching up to the, the knowledge that is thousands of years old. Um, and I think the, the important uh, case of the Fanganui River is a, one that, although you say it is not radical, you know, a, to traditional thinking and traditional culture, it is one that was, it's, I think, still incredibly important to take those steps in that direction. Um, and you say that there are still environmental components that are get, being given legal personhood. At what point will we get to the stage that ecosystems are given personhood rather than just components of the environment? Uh, thank you so much. And I'd love, we can, I'm sure we'll have some questions and come back to those ideas. Um, so next we're gonna pass to Kristen Walker, who is in the room there in Stockholm. Um, so Kristen, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Um, and I just want to acknowledge I'm so pleased to follow Justice Joe Williams. I've heard so much about him for many years. Um, so my name is Kristen Walker Pinamia, and I chair the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economics, and Social Policy, but I also work at Conservation International. I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer, um, I'm a mother. Um, um, I sit in the crossroads of social issues and conservation. And I'm also married to a Mapuche Indian whose family has also suffered as environmental defenders where my father-in-law has been jailed in defense of his own territory. So when I listen to Justice Williams talk about what is justice, that is the question we have. At the IUCN Congress in Marseille in September, um, through the work of the commission, we launched a campaign um, and work around reimagining conservation. And I think it's really appropriate to bring that conversation here. We are here this week celebrating Stockholm Plus 50. I think we've heard the what has happened since and much has been achieved. But I think if we look, we're on a cliff, right? We're on a cliff in terms of the lands that we occupy, the air that we breathe, the rights that we have, the identities that we have, and it's time for us to sort of wake up. Plus, we are on borrowed time and we are borrowing this planet from our future generation. So 
I'm here really to think about, and the question um, that Justice Williams posed is what is justice? And, and what I wanted to pose to all of you is we've, as a component of this reimagining conservation, which is a Western construct as well, um, we have talked about reimagining justice within the context of the commission, within the context of the work I do at Conservation International, we often work on the issues of human rights and conservation. I work with environmental defenders, whether it's indigenous peoples or whether it's staff at Conservation International, at staff at other organizations. And I think what I wanted to bring to this conversation is how can we work across these issues? Um, and I very much appreciated um, judge from Thailand talking about intellectual integrity and talking about one is once a decision is made, it's done according to justices, right? And then it has to go to enforcement. I think we know there are plenty of environmental laws out there. And really what happens is, is the implementation of those laws. Um, so we have one side is the implementation and the other side is the actual access to information. And I listened to you all talk about the new portal and the issue of language. While it does have translation, um, some of you are also limited by the languages those come out in. Um, so take that to a community context. Uh, in PNG, there are 700 languages, right? Um, take that to a community perspective who are trying to defend their territory, but the language they speak is not the language of law. And how can they possibly be able to defend their rights and their lands if they don't have that language or if the language of law is not in their own language? So I just wanted to bring that together in terms of these issues is one is taking those conversations down to those communities who are on the ground, those who will be in charge of and are in charge of taking care of their lands, their waters, and their territories in, very, in many manifestations. But how can we bring a better dialogue together <clears throat> with judges who are all here in this room, but with communities? And part of this reimagining work that we're doing is in a platform of four simple things. Listen. How can we all listen better? How can judges listen to communities? listen to those defenders of what's happening. How can you open up a broader dialogue and build that awareness um, and understand the social and economic issues? And also look at those problem solving court models that could happen. But then also from your perspective as judges, how can you imagine? How can you imagine coming over those hurdles and being able to support and implement what is there more effectively? And then finally, how can the collective take action? You are all here as judges trying to help each other be more grounded in environmental law, but how can you collectively take action? And I think, uh, or protest in your own way of making sure it's done effectively. So I just wanted to bring that to this conversation is how do we ground those things? How can the collective reimagine justice or perhaps define what justice is from various perspectives as Joe Williams said, um, and I think that's a task that I charge you all. We are all here this week celebrating success, but also on the cliff of potential failure. And we need to recognize that. Um, so my comments are short. I tend to challenge, I like to provoke, and I really like to poke Antonio a lot on these issues. So he knew what he was getting when he asked me to speak. Um, but I wanted to just leave you with um, a poem. Um, as part of the work that we're doing in the uh, IUSAN Commission on Environment, Economics, and Social Par Policy, we are working with environmental defenders, and we launched a three-part publication on environmental defenders that looked at the many faces of environmental defenders, how grassroots are in action, and then what do we need to do to protect them? And we did that at the IUSAN Congress. There's a three-part series. We're happy to share it. But what we did is not only told their stories, but shared their art and their poetry. So I wanted to share a poem that's a bit challenging, I think, for you all to listen to, but it underpins what the issues are. So I ask you all to close your eyes, take a deep breath. And this poem is called The Supply Chain of Violence by Sam, Sam's Illingworth. Illegal logging in community forests, oil drilling in indigenous territories, mining concessions in native soils, these have become our war zones. Activists held as terrorists, while global agribusiness is paraded as unchallenged 
an unchosen liberator. Forever on the right side of progress, writing its history with checks and laws and body bags, outsource resource consumption underpinned by marginalization turned ancestral lands into contemporary killing fields. Defenders fall in muted protest, their deaths the tip of melting icebergs as slow violence bleeds through faceless communities. Trading alms of Arvars, we wash our hands in waters, offering salvation for those that we no longer care to name. So this is the picture that we need to change. We've heard about the experience in, in New Zealand and how that's changing, but it's taken time. But I think we need the bridge to gap between what we have here and what we're confronting and where we need to head and who has rights and what is justice. So I challenge you all in your roles in your countries to think about how you all can work with stakeholders, communities, activists, and reimagine justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen, and thank you for the for the challenges and the challenging uh, words that you presented. That I think that what you said about the language of law was very interesting. The, the language not only in the linguistic sense, but also in the conceptual sense as well. When the very foundations, very concepts within those laws may not be the same as the concepts understood within the communities who are expected to address access to justice under those laws. Um, so thank you so much for that. And, and that poem you read was so powerful. And I think we need to talk more about the businesses, about the industry. We know we have the data that says that mining, agribusiness, these sectors are causing the greatest number of violations of environmental rights. Uh, perpetrated against environmental human rights defenders and so we I think we need to talk a little bit more about how and why and what do we do to to really address um, the issues that are there um, thank you so much so we now go to our last speaker Daniel McGraw who is uh, from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies Dan you have the floor Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I am a lawyer. I'm not a judge. I've been an arbitrator, um, but I, I deeply respect the work that all of you have to do. Um, and I, I want to say that it's it's hard. It was hard to imagine in 1996 when Donald and others started this work uh, that we could ever have a meeting like this. And and I hope you all recognize that that this is one of those success stories, actually, that we need success stories. This is one of them, and you're part of it, and, and I thank you all for that. There's truth in what each of the earlier speakers um, said, and I, I want to refer to that. Uh, in terms of what Arnold was talking about, the space for civil society to participate in environmental and human rights protection is diminishing. Um, it's partly because of slap suits, it's partly because of restrictions on uh, access to uh, information and communication technology to the internet and that sort of thing. There are other restrictions as well that are being imposed. And um, judges, I think, have to be very aware of that. Uh, in terms of slap suits, I've always wondered why there aren't more um, cases or that, that recognize an abuse of process, for example, but that's just my own view on that. Um, what Kristen is talking about, uh, she's talking about a broader view of judges, I think, as being parts of, of civil society, parts of the community, and uh, her challenge is extremely important. Um, uh, what Judge Williams talked about is something I want to talk about um, in, in a different context, uh, in a sense. I want to talk about a recent tool because I know as an arbitrator we had to we had to apply rules. As judges, you have to apply rules, um, and and um, I think rules matter. I represented the Mapuche, for example, in the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights, and I think we were able to protect their rights to to a, a significant degree because we had laws, we had human rights laws that we could work with. And, and so as much as I agree with uh, Judge Williams about 
we need to, to reconceptualize humans' relationship with nature. Um, I want to come back to, to the rules that you all need to apply as well. And the one I want to talk about uh, primarily is the right to a healthy environment. Now, as you may know, uh, many, many constitutions and national laws and even treaties contain this right. It's phrased differently in different instruments. Uh, but now there are about 155 countries that are, at least in theory, legally bound to respect uh, the right to what we call a healthy environment, the right to a healthy environment. Um, countries do this to different degrees, as you can imagine. And um, one of the goals of, of many of us has been to get universal recognition of that right uh, as a human right. And we achieved that this fall. It was a, an, a remarkable uh, constellation of efforts by many, many different people, including businesses uh, and children and uh, NGOs and 15 parts of the UN system. And uh, I could go on. Um, but in the Human Rights Council on October 8th, uh, by a vote of 43 in favor, zero opposed, and four abstentions, it was universally recognized that there is a right to a healthy environment. And so um, it, it's something we're going to the General Assembly now. Uh, we are uh, fairly certain it will pass. We're also certain there will be a vote. There, there will be countries, Russia, uh, the United States, that will block consensus. Uh, but we think it will uh, will pass. Over 100 countries have formally endorsed it. Uh, and and so the question is, well, is this a big deal? Is this, I mean, we've now changed the pantheon of human rights. There is now an environmental right in that pantheon. There wasn't, of course, in 1948 because there was no environmental consciousness. We weren't thinking that way. Um, but there is now, and it will be more powerful once the General Assembly uh, endorses it. So the question is, well, what's the value added there? Um, and and I think there, there are quite a few things, and I think it will come up in your court, so that's why I'm raising it, obviously. Uh, one thing is that it adds substance. It's different than adding uh, the, the uh, sum of the right to life and the right to culture and those different rights. Um, and I wasn't convinced of that myself, I should say, until I represented the Inuit uh, and the Maldives, both of whose cultures, whose whole existence is threatened by climate change and other environmental harm. And I realized that it's not just the right to life, which is threatened in both cases, or the right to culture, again, threatened in both of these very, very dissimilar um, uh, 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 environments. Uh, it's really a more general uh, issue of the right right to a healthy environment, a right uh, to an environment that's capable of supporting our civilization, of our societies. Um, so that's one thing, it adds substance. Uh, a second thing it does is that it clarifies the scope of what countries' obligations are. They're the duty holders, states. And, and it talks more about the whole environment, it doesn't just talk about um, Again, the right to life or clean air or clean water. It's the whole the whole interdependent system of the biosphere. Um, it also um, uh, is a capstone in a way. And, and what we've found is that countries that really try to respect this right have better environmental outcomes. Um, and it can lead to a kind of normative cascade uh, of, of, of different uh, protections uh, uh, of people, uh, primarily about the environment, but that includes the working environment, uh, et cetera. Um, it also can be a hook, a hook in the sense that um, countries, uh, intergovernmental organizations, agencies, parts of organizations like UNEP um, can use to organize programs and to get resources. An example of that is in 1996, we were able to get the global community to agree to eliminate lead from gasoline. Now it took many years to actually have that happen. But once we had that happen, we could go to UNEP and say, let's have a program on this. Let's get funds for this. And uh, a couple of years ago, Algeria was the last country to eliminate lead from gasoline. That saved millions and millions of lives. There's no question about it. 
Um, but it, we needed that hook. We couldn't we couldn't really do it globally until we had that global agreement at the head of state level. Um, so it, 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 this is important in that sense. I mean, as a judges, you don't have to worry about that, I think, but but understand that it's an important uh, right from that point of view. Um, it also can be a springboard, I think, for going back to the issues that Judge Williams uh, raised. I mean, it's a right, it's a human right to a healthy environment. So that the, the duty is owed to humans, but the object that has to be protected in a way is nature. That is, nature has to be uh, protected. We have to have a healthy environment. And I, th I think it's a way to get to begin to have a different discussion about about this relationship between humans and nature that that can be very healthy and is totally within both kinds of traditions i would i would uh, argue also the final point is it completes the notion of environmental justice a couple of the the speakers uh, this morning have mentioned that concept and uh, it, it has a number of different components. One is that no group, indigenous peoples or environmental human rights defenders or any other group should bear a disproportionate burden of protecting the environment. A second is that uh, all groups should have equal access to environmental amenities, clean drinking water, sanitation, uh, spiritual uh, recreational activities that nature provides, that sort of thing. Um, a third, is uh, the effect of the ability to, to uh, uh, participate effectively in decision-making about the environment. A fourth is our access to justice that we're, uh, all of us are talking about here. Um, but you could have all of those without having justice. If we go back to what Judge Williams and, and Kristen were talking about and Arnold too, uh, we need to have justice there. We need to have uh, an outcome that is just. And the way to get to that is with the right to a healthy environment because that will be a just outcome. So um, I, I, I recommend this to you uh, to, uh, as something to think about and to honor if it comes up to you in your courts. Um, I wanna say one more thing about, um, and that has to do with indigenous peoples. Uh, from a lawyer's point of view, uh, it raises this, this question raises a lot of issues. Uh, when I was the president of the Center for International Environmental Law, we represented a group in uh, the Amazon that did not wanna be contacted. So we could not talk to our clients. And you could imagine uh, the kinds of issues that raises. Um, but nevertheless, and it's not just a language issue, it's a whole way of life, a whole outlook on life, a whole ontogeny that's different. And to have, as a lawyer, to try to somehow interface with that is really very different. I, I want, one question I have for Judge Williams is, he, he, um, I'm not sure all indigenous peoples view these things the same way. Um, if, if they do, that makes it easier to try to make sure they're involved. I, I'm just not sure that's correct. But in, in, in any event, um, that, that issue is, you know, indigenous peoples have all the regular human rights. They also have rights under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And there are other things happening too. It's a dynamic system in the International Law Commission uh, draft principles that were just approved on on protecting the environment in the times of conflict. There's one article specifically about indigenous people's lands and, and protecting, protecting those. So, um, you know, as, as we know, the law is not static, it's dynamic, uh, but we have to, have to pay particular attention for various reasons to, to access to justice by indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And, you know, putting the focus on the upcoming, uh, hopefully, General Assembly resolution on the right to a, a healthy environment, um, that will be a very important step uh, to further the recognition of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment following the Human Rights Council resolution last year. Um, so now it's time for, for the Q&A, and I'm going to hand over to my co-moderator, Marina. Uh, you are here? 
Yes, thank you very much, George, uh, distinguished participants. I am honored to, to join this meeting today and take over chairing this session from my dear coach, uh, Georgina, from the UN Environment. Uh, thanks all the speakers for in this panel for their inspirational and thoughtful presentations. Uh, I assume that all participants have many questions to the panelists and would like to suggest continue this fascinating discussion and invite participants in the meeting room to come to the microphone and online participants to pose their questions in chat. And then we can invite the panelists sharing their brief feedback and uh, I can sum up the session. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Ragnil Noor. I'm a judge in the Supreme Court of Norway. And I will thank you very much for very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, you are highlighting indigenous peoples and uh, what uh, uh, climate change and environmental degradation can do to their culture and they, their way of life. We had a case in the Supreme Court of Norway recently, which was about uh, this aspect, but the damage was caused by the erection of windmills, which was erected, of course, to try to combat climate change. And it was, it's necessary in Norway to erect a lot of windmills if we are going to manage the shift towards a greener economy. But the Sami uh, group who lived in this area and who had reindeers gra grazing in part of this area, sued the government and said that this erection was in breach of the Convention of Civil and Political Rights, Article 27, which gives indigenous people right to uh, have their own culture. Um, <clears throat> and the Supreme Court of uh, Norway assessed the case. And in fact, we came to the conclusion that the decision to build these windmills and will windmills were already standing, but it was in breach of Article 27. But it's a difficult case because Sami people are also those who are most affected by climate change. They need these windmills also. Uh, but uh, still we came to this conclusion and mainly because we found that there would have been possible to put these windmills in areas where they didn't affect the Sami people that much. But still, uh, the windmill, the windmills, they are still there. It will be extremely costly to take them down and we don't know exactly what will happen. But I just want to put this on the table as an example for all the difficult challenges on this area. Uh, uh Thank you very much for the excellent question, Justice Noya. Uh, I could say also from our experience in the region, there is an increased number of uh, cases uh, related to renewable energy. And of course, it's explained that we are now in the era of great uh, uh, energy uh, transition and uh, increasing use of uh, sources from renewable energy. And we know that um, many uh, lists of hazardous activities that have been established, like in the Orcus Convention or in the ESPO Convention, they have been negotiated 20 years ago, maybe when these technologies were not yet spread. And sometimes uh, they indeed, uh, the decisions on uh, uh, launching these activities, on approving these activities might go under the radar of the environmental impact or it's maybe difficult to balance all the interests that uh, are involved uh, in this case and I really appreciate your question and would uh, love to hear the, the view of the panel on this matter. Uh, 
I'd be happy to comment. Thank you for uh, telling us about that case. That's very interesting. Um, nobody said this would be easy. <laughs> and that's your that's one of your points. It was very hard to get the international community to recognize that climate change and human rights were um, related at all. I mean, it seems obvious, I think, to lawyers that if if a state has to obey human rights with respect to all of its activities, that that includes activities regarding human rights, including um, mitigation of climate change, including adaptation uh, of climate change. So, but but getting countries to agree to that took literally decades. And um, uh, so it's important that countries are now doing that. In terms of uh, replacing the windmills, well, things are expensive sometimes and, and um, there are gonna be conflicts about that. It does, as I think our co-chair was saying, it, it reminds us of how important environmental impact assessments are. And there is a human rights obligation actually to do an environmental impact when an environmental harm might impact human rights. Um, and that's established, that's a human, that's an international human rights law impact. And as we also know from the International Court of Justice, there's a, a general international law obligation to do that in the transboundary context, but this was not transboundary, I take it. It was uh, within Norway. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for for the thoughtful feedback. I would uh, so can I, can I comment really quickly? Uh, oh, sure. Oh, or someone online? Yes. No, no, you go ahead. Are you sure, Joe? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, without knowing the case, except for the results, I guess my question was, how did it get that far? Because it was already established, right? I guess I, I'm thinking that how did it get that far that it would have already been constructed? And, and I know that in the work that I do, we have been working with indigenous peoples and negotiations, um, learning from what our Aboriginal colleagues in, um, in Australia and First Nations uh, in Canada have been doing related to negotiating agreements related to their lands and territories, um, whether it has to do with oil, gas, mining, or conservation, and how do you bring in their traditional practices in negotiating those agreements, but also Western sort of legal tactics in doing that to make sure that the outcomes abide by their views, but also that they benefit from the agreements that are happening or can reject them as well in terms of using those things. So not, you, we won't have time to open up the case, but I, I guess my question in my head was, how did it get that far that it, they're already constructed and needed to take down? But I can just answer shortly. Uh, the Sami people took it to the court uh, to try to stop it before it was erected, but the court said no. Um, so as a pre-assessment, they found that it, it was legal, but they also then uh, was um, given or a big amount of, of um, compensation. Uh, uh, and so everybody thought that they would say yes and thank you and stop there, but they didn't. I think Justice Williams wanted to say something. I thought I heard his voice. Okay. Well, well, I was I was just going to add to the comment that Christy, Kristen made. Um, in my country and other countries a bit like mine, uh, it's usually the case that the first property to be compulsorily acquired or condemned, I think you Americans call it, um, uh, is the indigenous resource, uh, whether it's for a road or for a dam or whatever it might be and the level of uh, procedural safeguards around that has in the past been very poor and it does appear to me that um, that may well have been the situation in Norway. Um, mm -hmm. I did say that um, uh, the, the, the trick is negotiated coexistence and in order to achieve that there has to be high levels of trust and engagement throughout. And for the most part, we're not there yet in most parts of the world.
Thank you very much. I saw that there was uh, also uh, interest to speak in the room. Thank you so very much. Um, yeah, we can speak on the mic. Yes, thanks, thanks, sorry. Uh, I feel a little intimidated. It's long since I appeared before this number of judges. My name is uh, Kiriako Tubiko from Kenya. I am the minister responsible for environment and forestry. Uh, we are here as part of the course, a co-host with Sweden for the Stockholm Plus 50 celebrations. Now, this uh, event was mentioned to me this morning by my colleagues who are here and I'm quite uh, proud of them. Uh, Donald, it's an institution, uh, Judge um, uh, Samson, uh, again, a judge who in Kenya, a very short time, has managed to uh, organize and you had him say structural interdict in, in terms of uh, litigation. Uh, Kenya's constitution is one of the first uh, constitution to include uh, a fundamental human right to clean and uh, safe environment. Uh, courtesy of his uh, court and his colleagues. Jurisprudence now has been developed in Kenya. And, uh, and, uh, I'm a lawyer by training. I was once a prosecutor. When I was appointed minister for environment and forestry, everyone was wondering, what does, what does law have to do with environment? And, 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 and sitting here now, I, I'm, I'm sure you have answered that question. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Kenya is one of the leading countries um, being the environmental capital of the world. Uh, our jurisprudence, we have just um, table before our parliament, a revolutionary amendment to our uh, environmental law, which includes a number of what I have had the judges speak to about today, here, including the protection, recognition and protection of environmental right defenders. It's now in a law pending before our legislation. You know, some countries were mentioned, Kenya was, uh, but yes. Also recognizing the right of nature, distinct from uh, the right or the right human rights. And, 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 and similarly, and this is very important, uh, a crime of ecocide. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure just as much as we're talking about establishing jurisprudence at domestic level, uh, and the debate about who bears uh, attribution for 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 being for bearing the the greatest responsibility, and especially uh, where we're talking about climate change. So Kenya's uh, law now pending in the National Assembly includes the uh, crime of ecocide. We borrowed largely uh, from the template that is now before the ICC, you know, and and, and um, um, maybe I missed during your discussions uh, because we have been um, pushing so very hard uh, at global levels in COP26 and other COPs. Now in, we will have to COP27 in Africa. The responsibility of those who bear the greatest responsibility, historical and current, for the greatest emission, greenhouse emissions, and, um, and, and the whole issue about loss and damage who should bear responsibility and so on and so forth. So to be very interesting, and this is a question, the professors and the uh, judges, whether um, at international levels, um, these um, establish or can be established, uh, the principles of liability for those who bear uh, greatest responsibility for those harms that uh, fall, flow from. And, and, and finally, I, you know, we meet as ministers for environment. Judges meet, meet as uh, um, judges, uh, environmental judges. I, I wish, how much I wish that my colleagues, I've just come in from, from another meeting with my with my ministers for environment. And, and I wish we were here to, 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 to see what, what is the interface between jurisprudence, law, and practice and policy. You know, we the, in executive, we make our own policies and sometimes take our decisions without necessarily reflecting upon 
or being informed, our advice about the jurisprudence, the best uh, international uh, 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 standard. So my suggestion is let's look at see and see how whether, including business. We, in the morning, we spoke so much about financing nature. Uh, financing nature. So, and, and I congratulate you, judges, and um, see uh, how we can work together. Um, and, and we need um, a, a policy interface with uh, judges. And finally, under my ministry, <laughs> we have uh, not not we have uh, subordinate tribunals that do also uh, dispense environmental justice. Uh, and I'm, I believe the same applies for other jurisdiction. And I don't know, and I'm sure a number of appeals go to uh, uh, our environment court. And I, how, do we, how do we harmonize the jurisprudence of our subordinate tribunals uh, with, uh, with the high court and Supreme courts that you judges uh, preside over? I thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much for sharing many important points and uh, your intervention uh, highlights uh, actually the crucial impo uh, uh, importance of looking into the nexus between uh, the environment and the human rights and the good governance. And only this uh, nexus uh, approach could help us to uh, advance an action uh, into uh, better protecting the environment. Uh, very often, many decisions indeed uh, uh, are taken into silence. And uh, systems uh, that were presented, for example, in Brazil, the, uh, this uh, digital tool could actually serve as a very important point for the decision makers because uh, seeing the a greater picture of uh, where the uh, legal challenges are uh, in the country at which stage of decision-making process could actually help to improve the decision-making itself and to improve laws, to strengthen the procedure that uh, recourse to justice is not indeed done at the very later stage and the problems can be anticipated at uh, the earlier. Uh, element and I would like to see uh, to invite also uh, panelists if they would like also to comment on the uh, on, on the point that uh, I mentioned by the Honorable Minister of Kenya. Well, um, thank you, Minister. I I would comment on a couple of points. The um, interface between the executive and the judiciary is um, always it's it's like um, porcupines cuddling <laughs> you have to do it very carefully um, and and there's good reason for that uh, I I agree that there'd be a lot to be said for sitting around a table and having an open and frank chat, but it's a very dangerous thing to do. And the better thing to do is to have uh, a chat on the end of a 40 foot barge pole called case law and statutes. Uh, unfortunately, but the independence of the judiciary is too important for um, the sort of conversation we'd all like to have to actually have. Um, as to, um, I, I was struck by that idea of the crime of ecocide. Um, I'd be very interested to see how that crime is articulated and, um, and how widespread that is uh, uh, beyond your country, beyond uh, Kenya. One of the things I think this organization um, must have been constructed for. This is the first time I've ever participated in anything related to it. Um, and one of the great contributions it can make is in sharing developing standards, developing principles, developing values, 
in the application of environmental law by the judiciary um, so that we are not in our own silos, me at the bottom end of the Pacific um, and you in Africa, each of us independently reinventing uh, the same wheel. Uh, inevitably, that produces a wheel that's got a wobble or a flat tire. So this opportunity to share these ideas, to hear what is best practice, what has worked and what hasn't worked, is something that is greatly empowering for judges who are having to apply law to actual facts. Actual facts, usually, that the politicians haven't thought of. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other contributions also in the meeting room? If I could um, ask a question, and I am particularly interested in asking uh, Kristen and Arnold about the role of judges with respect to environmental defenders. This is a great luxury to have two people who have spent so much time um, giving consideration to the unfortunate pattern that's arisen, which is a continuing use of uh, murder against a group that's maybe the most committed to trying to protect the earth. But with respect to the role of judges, I uh, would mention that um, one of the great justices of uh, Colombia, Louis Tolosa, flew to Peru because of an uh, indigenous leader that was assassinated, uh, Edwin Chota, in 2016 to support the village of Edwin Chota. I suppose that might be an example of something that could be done in an organized way by a group like the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. But <clears throat> on the other hand, there's a concept of judicial independence that would suggest that judges aren't actually supposed to be involved in promoting prosecution. So you've got the role of judges to make clear that the rule of law that is important includes not using murder. So the rule of law should be a, a, a applied there, but how far can judges go? So mm -hmm. I'd be interested, Kristen, in what your thoughts are maybe about the extent to which judges can help in an organized way. And, and Arnold, I know that's been a big focus of yours. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Thank you very much. Can, 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 can you comment, please, on Arnold? And, uh... Marina, you want me to go first, or uh, Chris can go first? I lost uh, the audio, Marina. Sorry, I suggest that uh, as uh, you open the microphone, maybe you can go first. Thank you. All right, happy to do so, Marina. And aloha, Mike. Uh, good to see you. I really wish I was there with you all. Uh, but Mike, I think uh, in part you've um, you've sort of uh, uh, answered the question. I mean, what I tried to highlight also in my in my uh, uh, remarks to you a little bit earlier is that. We at UNEP feel one key challenge for judges is awareness of the challenges that environmental defenders are facing, right? Uh, I've hinted at these uh, slab lawsuits, uh, but also the basic understanding of the role that environmental defenders play in the administration of environmental justice. And uh, uh, I want to congratulate also my learned friend, Dan, who has really summarized excellently the different components of environmental justice that uh, we believe judges need to look at. But ultimately, Mike, I think we need the entire enforcement uh, chain to work uh, on this uh, complex topic. And so you're right, we need prosecution, we need enforcement agencies. And that's why we at UNEP also, when we look, for example, at environmental crime and, and the minister uh, mentioned uh, these very exciting developments that are happening in Kenya with respect to that, we need the entire enforcement chain. And then, you know, the judiciary needs to do its part. But I also try to 
illustrated for the most part, I think judges, uh, you know, going forward simply need to do what judges do, right? But with this additional or added increasing awareness of the environmental uh, issues that come before courts. And that's why what you are doing in this room right now in Stockholm is so important and what the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment does is so important. Uh, and, um, you know, we need to improve the, the understanding, the awareness and the education of judges on environmental matters, because this, I believe, will go uh, very, very far in, uh, in protecting environmental defenders when, uh, you know, cases of intimidation, threats, harassment, uh, you know, come into court proceedings so that judges are aware of the underlying issues. I've highlighted a lot of these slap cases, of course, brought on completely different matters, but if judges have that understanding, then they can make the right uh, connections and ultimately then protect the environmental defenders. But long uh, story short, uh, Mike, I think we need the entire enforcement chain. That's why we at UNEP, yes, we have a focus uh, of uh, within our work to work with judges, but we do also work with the other legal stakeholders to make sure uh, that also they are aware of the threats that environmental defenders face, because only then can we make a difference. And as the minister has rightly pointed out, there needs to be also, and this is, I believe, part of environmental rule of law, the legal basis needs to be adequate. And so uh, also our work with parliamentarians uh, is underpinned by this effort to make sure that, uh, you know, from parliamentarians onto the enforcement chain, ending with the judiciary, we have the same sort of uh, um, objective in terms of protecting environmental defenders, because only then can we make a difference. Um, many thanks for the question again, Mike. and. Uh, uh, back over to you, Marina. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would invite uh, Kirsten to also to share the, the perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would agree with that. It's building that awareness, right? I mean, Global Witness puts out a report every year. We know that 227 environmental defenders died in 20, 2020. And understanding the why, the how that happens and understanding that and that decision-making process is probably one of the most important things that can happen and how you move that forward. But I think uh, as been highlighted, it's the whole system. And, and I think part of this reimagining is looking at the systems we have to protect the planet, whether it's through the judiciary in the court or whether it's through how we actually protect nature in different ways. Um, these are the things that maybe aren't as sexy out there that people wanna talk about, but it's how do you tweak those system or rewire things to be able to respond more effectively to the issues at hand. And I think as judges, the best thing is to be able to build awareness, build awareness understand what's going on, um, and then see how things are executed into the future. But I think that's probably the best thing. Dan wants to respond. Thank you. If I could just add uh, I, uh, to your question, what, what can you as an institute do? Uh, it seems to me that one question that came up in, in a was a webinar a couple of months ago was, well, what should the standards be? And I think that that's something that the Judicial Institute could, could in, in, engage in a discussion about. There is a case in the Americas that says, well, the, 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 it holds that what a country needs to do is first, it shouldn't interfere with an environmentalist, environmental defender, if you want to use that term. Second, if there's a threat to an environmental defender, it should it should protect against that threat. It should take action to to stop that threat. And third, if there is harassment, and we have to remember that murder is just one way of harassing. Uh, the the Kenyan judge described uh, the the case of the lead batteries. Well, the woman who brought that, her partner's kid was kidnapped, and um, you know, as part of the retaliation, and and was only released actually when the head of UNEP and the special rapporteur on on human rights and environment contacted the president of Kenya and and said, you know, you've got to help. And he did. And and the child was released. But there are all sorts of ways of harassing. So this covers all of it. But on the third point, when there is harassment of any type, then there should be a serious investigation and prosecution. So I think if if those standards were well known and the train, you know, the Institute can help train judges on that, 
then that that would do something. That wouldn't take care of the problem, but it would help. Thank you very much. And uh, I know that this is a fascinating discussion, but I'm afraid that unfortunately our time is uh, running out. I get uh, many helpful takeaways from this discussion and actually that underlined not only current uh, challenges, but also opportunities and actions required to safeguard the nature and environmental systems, empower people and guarantee the rule of law. And uh, the Stockholm Declaration initially paved the way to many multilateral environmental agreements. And one important point that was mentioned by several speakers is that the judges have a pivotal role to play in interpreting provisions of domestic law in accordance with this uh, treaties that establish the common standards in uh, the various areas. Uh, for countries in Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia, uh, the Orcus Convention and its access to justice pillar became a common ground influencing environmental ca case law and providing legally binding standards in empowering people uh, to seek justice in cases of information refusal and flaws in decision making and compliance with environmental law by public authorities and by private persons. Following the Aarhus Convention example, the Ascazu Agreement also embedded access to justice provisions for Latin America and the Caribbean. And COVID-19 pandemic underlines the importance of this international uh, legally binding standards and standing scope of review costs and remedies that should be compliant by the parties and uh, overcoming existing barriers in access to justice, notwithstanding uh, other crisis pressures from economic and uh, social dimensions. Additionally, both treaties, as well as also mentioned earlier, a human rights instrument and other initiatives are stepping up the protection of environmental defenders against murder, unfortunately, harassment, and any other form of retaliation, retaliation for exercising their rights. And strategic lawsuits against uh, public participation or abuse of litigation, their threats and their impunity also have become a significant barrier to access to justice that requires special legal and practical measures for their detection and uh, prevention. We have heard that additional barriers are faced by indigenous people, people in the rural areas, people in informal settlements, poor people, and other group, groups that can be disproportionately uh, exposed to environmental injustices. And uh, these challenges include uh, distances to courts, access to legal and environmental expertise, and language barriers. A special assistance to such groups should be considered to enable their effective access to justice and we would need to continue to search for good practices and solutions in this area. Handling of environmental cases also bear legal, scientific, technical and social complexities. Specialization, access to advanced training programs in environmental law and independent uh, environmental expertise and assessments can provide critical solutions for effective handling of such cases. And uh, promoting judicial cooperation at the national, regional, cross-regional and global levels remains crucial for harnessing good practices and innovative tools in this area. So let me warmly thank the organizers and contri contributors of this session for their excellent event and confirm our readiness to continue the collaboration with all present partners to turn thoughts into action for strengthening access to justice, protecting environmental defenders and promoting environmental rights, the rule of law and environmental matters. Thank you very much. And with this, I close the session.